Welcome to the Paramedia Podcast. Namaste and hello everyone. This is uh, Mukunda Raghavan on the Mirror Media Podcast. Today I'm joined with co-host Krishna Parthasarthi and we have a very special guest, Swami Sadhra Priyananda from the Ramakrishna Mission in New York. Namaskaram Swami, how are Namaste. you? Namaste. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, uh, Swamiji. Uh, you know, we've been, we've been, uh, Kitta has been talking, uh, or Krishna has been talking about you for years now. And I got <laughs> into, uh, 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 finally got to watching a few of your videos and listening to your lectures uh, months ago. And I was really captivated with um, how deeply you're able to engage with um, not only on the Advaita side of, of the Hindu thought, but also in the in Western context with interlocutors from, you know, the philosophy of uh, Western philosophy or the science of consciousness or, um, you know, uh, great thinkers like Chal Chalmers and uh, uh, Canada, uh, I mean, Bernardo Castro. I, I, I find your conversations to be very illuminating because I think you come from a deep understanding of both the, our traditions and then like the traditions of the West in, in a way I think uh, many Swamis and scholars don't. So I uh, thank you so much for, for, for that. <laughs> First of all, that knowledge you put out there. <laughs> Thank you. So, so, um, so, Swamiji, if you can, um, what, what's your background? How did you decide to become a Swami? Because that takes a lot to suddenly decide that one is going to be, um, you know, uh, celibate and without any uh, attachments to the world. And I mean, that's that's a lot. How how do you get there? Um, a well, good question. There are two kinds of uh, ways into which in which uh, young men become monks in my experience having talked with a lot of our uh, young monastic novices i taught monastic novices at our main ashram in uh, belurmat in india so um what i gathered was some of them do as you said suddenly become monks there's a sudden change and inflection in their lives in their life story and others um um, it's not sudden. It's, it's almost something that they've always known that they're going to be since childhood. So I sort of belong to the, the second category. I grew up um, in uh, on the eastern part of India in Orissa, in Bhuvaneshwar. And uh, my parents were very close to the Ramakrishna Mutt there. And from childhood onwards, I would uh, go to that ashram in Bhuvaneshwar, which is a very beautiful ashram. I, I liked everything that I saw there, but I read a lot. Uh, I was always been I've been a bookworm, so I read a lot. I'm, I think I'm lucky enough to be part of the probably the last generation before cable TV and certainly certainly <laughs> before in, in internet. So all we had were books, uh, and my father had lots of books on Vivekananda, on Vedanta, and yoga. So I read a lot, um, and I liked all of what I read. And so what happened was. Um, I, as far back as I can remember, I can I remember scribbling on my school notebook, my goal in life. It us, usually, it was number one, like every little boy want to fly planes and be a pilot. But number two was find God, search for God. <laughs> as I grew older, that became the only goal. Uh, I still love aeroplanes, but uh, <laughs> that became the uh, only goal. And uh, um, I knew more and more about monks. So by the time... I finished my education. I had absolutely no doubt that I was going to be a monk. And I haven't looked back ever since. I joined the order in 1994. And I haven't looked back ever since. Wait, did, did you find God? <laughs> I won't answer that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so here's an interesting thing. A, a, a part of me is, is interested in the fact that monkhood and the ability to become a monk is such an an opportunity or an option in India, right? In, in a way that it's not in the West. So why do you think like for someone like you, there's a desire that arises that this is an option I can choose this path. Do you find that people in the West have that similar desire, but they don't have the same avenues to do so? Like, you know, you can become one in Ramakrishna mission or, you know, you could go in, 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 in Advaita mission in uh, Mata or whatever it is. There's there's avenues or even outside of the uh, that there's like the 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 you know the nagas and the various other sadhus out there. So there, there's a huge like ecosystem, but we don't find the same thing in the West. It, it can't be that 
I think human desire for for uh, for that you know ascetic life is is missing here, right? I think you're absolutely right. Uh, there are cultural differences and there are historical reasons for this state of affairs. Um, but you're right. In India, there is and has been um, the opportunity for a monastic life. See, the spiritual quest is for everybody. It's spirituality is for everybody. I often say that the Bhagavad Gita, if you want to take one text representative of Hinduism, especially of Vedanta, it would be the Bhagavad Gita. And it was taught by Krishna, a householder, to Arjuna, another householder. And after the end of that instruction, um, both remain householders. <laughs> so, And the sources of our tradition go back to the rishis of the Upanishads, almost all of whom were householders. Not all, but all, so almost all. At the same time, we find from the most ancient times in India, we find monasticism. Sometimes individual hermits, sometimes in ashrams, um, leading the celibate life and uh, a spiritual quest. So everything for the spiritual quest and nothing for anything else. That's the basic idea of monasticism. Uh, Buddhism is often uh, credited with uh, the monasticism of India, but that's really not true. I mean, the, in the Buddha story himself, you, you see one of the four sites he's supposed to have seen, you know, the, the sick man and the uh, old man and the dead man and the hermit, the monk. So there are monks all over the place at that time. Um, Jainism, uh, Jain monasticism is older than Buddhist monasticism. And all the way back in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, um, which is one of the oldest Upanishads, you find uh, uh, clear discussions of uh, renunciate life. In fact, our uh, sannyasa mantras and the whole structure of uh, Advaitic sannyasa is based on uh, the, these Upanishads. So even more ancient than the Buddhist or Jain monasticism. Um, so yes, and it, down to today. Um, some religions are are strongly monastic. Some are less so. Some are not at all so. So for example, I'm sure Buddhism is heavily monastic. Jainism is heavily monastic. And uh, even more than India, I'm sure it's easier to become a monk in Sri Lanka or in uh, Myanmar or in Thailand. Right. They have even more heavily monastic uh, cultures. Monks are looked upon with favor there. Uh, on the other hand, uh, so for example, in the West, there was a strong tradition of monasticism in Catholic Christianity. Uh, but the Protestant reforms did away with that. And yeah. America here is, um, as Jeff mentioned in, in his interview, there's a default religious setting here in America. Whether you're religious or not religious, whatever religion you belong to, the default setting is uh, Protestant Christianity. That's mm -hmm. in the back of their minds when people think of religion. And that does not have monasticism. Right. It was yeah a deliberate decision to set monasticism as, aside. Um, Sikhism in India does not have monasticism, though I have found the Sikhs have a great regard for Hindu monastics. Uh, but they so do yeah. have the they do have the 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 jogis and the who 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 they would some of them would be monastics, right? I the guess, uh, but it's generally a householder religion. Yeah. Islam, again, does not have generally have monasticism. There always have been hermits and mystics, individual sure. mystics, especially Judaism, uh, also does not have regular monasticism. Again, there have been prophets and uh, mystics. Um, so these two uh, kinds of religions are there. But because of this predominantly Protestant religious default setting in, in the United States, monasticism is not something that people are generally familiar with. I think they have become more familiar with it ever since the last 50, 60 years of um, uh, of clearly Indian influence or Buddhist influence from the Far East. Uh, now people sort of have an idea. I'm often mistaken for a, a Hare Krishna monk, especially here in New York. <laughs> this is where the Hare Krishnas got their start, this con. Um, so yes, some places are more congenial to monasticism, some are not, but the spiritual impulse is universal. Yeah, so it's interesting to me because... I, I... I mean, this is just me thinking out loud in some sense. I feel like having the option of monasticism is a, a great means of of, uh, of of quelling young men's energy in some sense. Like people that choose that path, you know, in I think they're less likely to have, you know, these issues that we find we're starting to find crop up in the West where where young men tend to have a lot more uh, anger and frustration about the world, where I think the 
like having that option, especially I think historically in India, and this is just me throwing it out there, allowed men to have a community and also have a spiritual pursuit and a purpose that was merely outside the the desire to to procreate and create a life of oneself that allowed, you know, for that aggression and to be funneled properly. It's, it's just some weird theory I have. And I, I just can't well, that's one head. side to it. But you also remember there have been uh, communities of women ascetics also. Sure. Um, the Buddhist Sangha had women ascetics thousands of years ago. Yeah. So so did the um, Jain ashrams have bhikkhunis. And, um, and there have been uh, some instances of Hindus, uh, sannyasinis also. Yeah. But you're right. Uh, strong monastic communities have been a feature of um, South Asia for as long back as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, and then so you just knew you wanted to be... Uh... Uh, a monk and then why did you choose the Ramakrishna mission as opposed to you know any any plethora of other you know uh, uh, matas or uh, uh, you know orders I guess looking back I sort of grew into it because um, my parents were devotees my father and mother were initiated devotees in the Ramakrishna mat uh, my grandparents on my father's side were uh, devotees I think it started with them so three generations were already devotees um my cousins were also initiated, and, and that's what that was my first direct introduction to religion as such. Mm. So, religion for our family was Sri Ramakrishna, Masharada, Swami Vivekananda. A temple for our family primarily was the local ashram, though we did visit, you know, very occasionally, very very occasionally, the sh great ancient Shiva temples in um, Bhuvaneshwar, and of course the Jagannath temple in Puri. But very occasionally, I I have memories of those. But religion for us meant the Ramakrishna Mat and the Ramakrishna Ashrams. So it was, uh, that's one side of it. And there were all these books at home. But um, as I grew older and I, uh, I would visit other ashrams, just, I was very curious about religion. I liked it actually. And I sort of liked the, the religious, spiritual atmosphere of ashrams wherever I went. I mean, I, even old churches, yeah. Have that that vibration, that deep uh, inwardness. So, um, but I liked more and more what I read about the Ramakrishna order. And that has remained with me ever since. Now I'm, of course, an insider. I would say that. But <laughs> but it's true. Uh, I so mean, there are you, many, many sides to it. This can I direct, interrupt you one second? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, Swamiji, but did you ever have a period where you uh, lost faith or had no uh, shraddha or uh, it's called asambhavana, I think? Did, uh, did, did, was that, did you ever have that in your life or were you always uh, have shraddha? I, I never had that. I mean, I guess I'm fortunate that way, even from childhood till now. It just mm -hmm. became more and more intense till I decided I'm going to act upon it. I mean, I was un uncertain at first. As a kid, I'd never done anything so big, like give up everything and walk out. <laughs> <laughs> and Indian kids of that generation, you know, we were very um, close to the family. And um, this was the pre-internet generation. My only idea of the world was from Time magazine and uh, <laughs> so uh, and Doordarshan, the, the TV that we had in <laughs> India in those days. Um, so, yes, uh, more and more I read about the Ramakrishna order. So, for example, what appealed to me first and foremost was that God is real and God can be experienced. It's not so much a question of whether you believe in God or not. It's a real power which can be experienced. That was what turned Narendra Nath Datta into Vivekananda. He went around asking famously the you know, people in Calcutta in the late 19th century, um, have you seen God? So that was the theme of his spiritual quest. And of course, he found Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, who um, straight away uh, said that, yes, I have, and you too can. So that impressed me no end. And the Ramakrishna Vivekananda literature is replete with, uh, with uh, accounts of spiritual practice and uh, realizations and so on and so forth. So that was one. Uh, second was the liberality of it all, uh, that, uh, you know, whether you're a monk, which is highly prized and praised. And at the same time, no, if you're a householder also, um, all of you can attain to spiritual realization and the same spiritual realization, uh, whether you're a man or a woman. Uh, that issue was not so strong in those days. But over time, I've seen uh, whatever your uh, sexual orientation, whatever your gender, whatever your caste, um, 
I came from, one has to remember, I came from a very, uh, my parent, my father was a bureaucrat. So the community was what you might call uh, a kind of Nehruvian socialist uh, community in those days. Um, thanks to my parents, I was introduced to the Ramakrishna mission, to Ramakrishna Vivekananda. But most of my friends um, grew up in a very secular kind of environment. They had just some kind of cultural connection with Hinduism. Um, and so it was a very upper crust, upper crust bureaucratic uh, community, mm -hmm. IAS and IPS officers in a small mm -hmm. town. Bhavaneshwar now is a booming town, but it was a very quiet town in those days. So I, I was the one of, I think maybe the only one in our small group of friends who was quote unquote spiritual in that sense, you know. I listened. I would listen to Bhaja Govindam. I would listen to um, Chidananda Rupa Shivoham in Dilip Kumar Rai's and, and on this old LP. Of, um, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah. I, then I liked the absolutely logical, you know, they, they didn't say anything that was against mainstream science. It's nothing against what I read in uh, in school textbooks. I didn't think so clearly at that time, but later I realized I had no cognitive dissonance between what I was reading in uh, Vedanta, yeah. um, in, in Vivekananda's teachings, then the entire thing about the harmony of religions, all of it really, I, and also another side of it, which I was not particularly interested, but I thought is very really good, is the social side of it. Yeah, I, My quest was uh, primarily spiritual, but I was very glad that this organization and this movement and runs schools and hospitals and comes forward in times of floods and famines and you know uh, earthquakes. Uh, I think that's a really good thing. Uh, if it even if it did not, I would still have that spiritual quest. But right. that it did was very good for me. That it was um, uh, it was sort of nourishing to know that um, as a monk, whatever I do in my spiritual sadhana, wherever that takes me, at the same time I'm part of an organization which ceaselessly does huge amounts of good. To lots of people who need it. No, that's, fant people, yeah. no, no that's fantastic. I mean, I, I must have imagined at some level when you decided to become a monk and you took the sannyasi. I mean, do you did you have to cut your family off, or how does that also work? And, well, and yes, how, yes. Uh, so the traditional Hindu monk, uh, you completely cut off from your past, from your past. So um, that would mean parents and siblings. Um, I, often it means your place of birth and where you grew up, you go as far away from that as possible and don't keep in touch, which was a lot easier in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no mobile phones. <laughs> yeah. uh, and again, the Ramakrishna order, the Ramakrishna mat is uh, reasonable as in all things. So it's not that you have to disappear without a trace. In fact, they tell you that you take permission from your parents, right. let your parents know where you are. It's a spiritual adventure for you, but for them, it's a shock. It's a terrible huh. shot for them. So um, be gentle with that. At the same time, no compromise on principles. Yeah, uh, They would say, yes, let your parents know and that you're doing well. If they want to come and visit you in the monastery, yes. On the other hand, you are not going... The other, other extreme is also bad, in that you are not cutting off at all. Yeah. So, uh, that is also bad. You can't become a monk unless you step out of your past condition, your past um, sure. frame. So what, what did your can I ask you what did your social peer group tell you when you decided to become a well, they are two not not to all of them except one or two people who were interested in spiritual life uh, they, all, the, all the rest they thought I was crazy <laughs> <laughs> uh, here you are you are uh, 23 years old you've just completed an MBA that was Come something on. new ITM, right? yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, I'm sorry what did you say you said you, you went to IIT for a business degree right no That's no no I didn't I, I didn't uh, no, oh, no, no, no. I didn't. I'm... I went to, I've given talks at IIT uh, and somehow people have conflated the two. But uh -huh. I never studied in IIT. I wasn't sharp enough. Some of my friends got into it, but I, uh -huh. I, I, I wasn't intelligent. No, I didn't try. Um, I went, I did my economics. My dad had studied economics, so uh, he wasn't too disappointed, unlike other, you know, middle class Indians who would always want the children to be engineers or doctors. But because my dad liked economics and I, when I chose economics, he was happy. Um, but after that, I did an MBA. And uh, uh, so my friends thought, you're crazy. They all were looking forward to, and at that time, it was the first wave of liberalization coming through in India. Right. So an MBA was something, I'd, I'd not even heard about it before I got into it. <laughs> uh, so uh, you get these shiny multinational uh, jobs. Uh, and I, I remember... 
the in the campus interview somebody from our senior batch got a job which paid him 10000 rupees all of that per month and when i t- went and t- told a monk in the ashram this was before i became a monk yeah that you know this new thing i'm doing it's called an mba and you get lots of money here is a friend of mine who got, he's getting 10000 paid 10000 rupees a month and the monks were stunned what is he going to do with all that money <laughs> so much money what are you going to do with it um uh, so they thought i was crazy uh, but there were exceptions uh, at least a couple of people who uh, who were interested in spiritual life and uh, they uh, they i think there's a some kind of fly past and i don't know if they are rehearsing for thanksgiving <laughs> yeah so uh, they were interested and they supported me they actually even saw me off at the train station in bhuvaneshwar when i when i went off to become a monk yeah did you go to bellore to to take your 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 uh, your diksha there I was initiated into mantra, mantra diksha. Anybody can get. Yeah, yeah. Get. I meant it is sannyasa. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. So for uh, for becoming a monk, you join the order in any one of our ashrams. Now there are more than two hundred and fifty ashrams across the world, so you can join any one of them. But you first let let the head swami know who you yeah. are and where you're coming from. Uh, basically, you just have to be um, a young unmarried man below the age of thirty, and uh, so the unmarried part is because. We want people who are not putting others into trouble, you know. Right. If you have a wife and children, so you don't want to get into the trouble of uh, Gyaneshwar's dad. Yes, <laughs> yeah, a lot of suffering for this. Though traditionally it is allowed. Yes. So the Upanishads say that uh, um, after um, Brahmacharya, Grihastha, Vanaprastha, yeah. one becomes a sannyasa. Sannyasa. However, it says. Um, yadareva virajet, tadareva pravrajet. The day you get dispassion for the world and you want to realize God, then you that's the up. day you should renounce the world. And it says, Brahmacharyatva, Grihatva, Vanatva. That means straight from the uh, celibate student's life or from the married householder's life or from your forest dwelling, retired life. Any From any stage, you can become a monk. But right, which is Yagyavalka does that at the Yagyavalka right, does he, that. Yes, he leaves his wives and tells them, "Take my wealth or take my knowledge, and I'm going to go my way." Exactly, and that's the paradigm of Hindu monasticism. It's all the way back in the Brihadar Nikupanishad. Um, however, the modern Hindu monastic orders, which all, by the way, have been modeled upon our order, it's Vivekananda who sort of made the framework. But now, if you see whether it is the ISKCON or the Chinmay Mission or the Arshavidya or many, many other organizations, even contemporary older organizations like the Swaminar, and they have some iteration of that kind, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they have some limitations, all of these modern uh, organizations, limitations, of, you know, age limitation uh, and educational limitations because of the demands of organizational life. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's fascinating. So, uh, so you became... Uh... A monk, and then how long did you stay in India, uh, studying, learning, and then uh, teaching before you moved oh, to I, the US? I joined the order in our ashram in Deoghar, which used to be in Bihar, in a state called Bihar, but uh-huh. after Bihar was bifurcated into Jharkhand and Bihar. So Deoghar is now in Jharkhand. Um, we have a big ashram there. It's a very ancient pilgrimage place called Vaidyanath Dham. It's a te- Shiva temple there. And our ashram is also there in that that city. Um, so it was a small, sleepy pilgrimage town when I joined in 1994. Now it has its own airport and so on. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, that ashram was our first residential school. The Ramakrishna Mission is quite well known for its residential schools for boys. Um, the, so it's, it's Deoghar Vidyapit, 1922. They just celebrated their 100 years. Mm-hmm. I joined there. I stayed for a few years there. And we were, all of us, we go for this compulsory training at our main monastery in Belur, Belur Mat on the Ganga, uh, just across from Calcutta. This was established by Viveka, Swami Vivekananda himself. And the, there is a training center there where brahmacharis undergo two, two years of um, very rigorous training, <clears throat> especially study and meditation and so on. So I went there, came back to Deoghar, 
then i came to again back to belur there was we have this teacher training institute which i taught in and i was the principal of that for a four or five years then a very nice period of uh, which i re uh, really thoroughly enjoyed in between i was in our nascent university at that time the, the vivekananda university and then i was at this place where i i had a really thoroughly good time in the main monastery itself teaching monastic novices teaching the shastras so what i'm doing now that period was like a period of preparation where you right. yeah it was basically a job so the monks in the ramakrishna order have many kinds of jobs you know so it could be running a hospital or a school sure. but for me for about 7 or 8 years it was just study the shastras and teach the new, the brahmacharis so it was a really good preparation for what i'm doing now right um after 10 years of preparation 9 years actually one becomes a monk a sanyasi so you 9 years you are a, a novice a brahmachari you are dressed in white and you have a shikha and sutra and everything and then uh, you put on the ochre you take the vows of monasticism that happened to me that i took that in 2004 and i was granted sanyasa in 2004 i got the name sarva priyananda and uh, it was in 2015 that i was asked to come to the united states to teach i was for one year in los angeles Yeah. in our vedanta society of southern california yeah at at hollywood and then in new york so new york vedanta society has a very interesting history it's the first hindu ashram in the west i mean you could arguably the theosophical society and all were there but yeah. established by a hindu teacher from uh, india as an ashram this is the first one 1894 uh, swami vivekananda oh. came in 1893 and 18 next very next year they started the vedanta society of new york Next year's hundred and thirty years, huh? Yes, and wow, it's been. Wow. Uh, it's, so he established two Vedanta societies, uh, Vivekananda. One was in eighteen ninety four here in New York, and then San Francisco, uh, in San Francisco, eighteen ninety nine. That's right. These yeah. two and others came up over time. So uh, since twenty seventeen January, I've been here in New York and I've been teaching. Wow, I mean right. that's that's a that's a wonderful story, um, journey. It, you know. I, can I ask you a question about this? Is one of the things that struck me, at least growing up in this country, and then and then trying to learn to be Hindu and and kind of understand what that means, and and why have do you think not only Ramakrishna Matas or other Matas not have created like a type of school in America for for children from like. young age to not just indian children and hindu children but like everyone else like whether you go to yeah. shiva or you go to like you know there might be christian schools you know that teach their bible or whatever and why don't we have any of those going on in in the us i mean because i feel like there's so much of so much knowledge from the ramakrishna mission there's deeply connected rooted entrenched in not only american culture but part of american like you know like people know around a christian mission wherever you go um i i feel amongst all the the great matas ramakrishna mission has the most on the ground understanding of 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 this and i've always wondered it's not a ramakrishna issue but on the hindu issue why don't we have good educational structures in place to teach not only our children but the western children in the western world of what the great knowledge we bring to the table Yes, I'll split that into two questions. One yeah. is the particular question about the Ramakrishna Mission itself, the Vedanta Societies, as yes. we are known here. Uh, why don't we have programs for children? A lot of people ask this question. Yeah. And the second question would be the wider Hindu uh, question: Why don't we have clear, you know, educational right. programs for children? Uh, and one doesn't have to look too far to find answers to these. The Vedanta Societies, where you have to remember, what was the primary reason for the Vedanta Societies? Uh, it was to transmit to teach and transmit vedanta to the west uh, it was exactly what vivekananda was doing when he came here first and then his brother disciples other disciples of sri ramakrishna who followed him uh, especially swami abhedananda but other swamis also swami saradananda turiyananda and um, especially swami trigunathitananda all of them their whole idea was to um, transmit certain teachings of hinduism Uh, the philosophical side of it, uh, the the yogic meditative side of it, and it was uh, it was directed at people who were seekers. Mm -hmm. 
So we were not going out there and trying to convert people, change, make them change their religion. Rather, we felt, Vivekananda felt, that there are certain things in Hinduism which can and should be adopted by people all across the world, the people of different religions. And right. if they did, um, it would be all the better for them and for the world. For that, you don't have to actually become a Hindu. Um, though if you wanted to, you could. Sure. Now, so this was the thrust. So it was not particularly aimed at children because you wouldn't typically expect a little kid to be a spiritual seeker or a yogi. It's mostly the parents who were interested. Um, but that does not mean that there was no effort at all. Um, mm. Because from the very beginning in the histories of the Vedanta societies, we find something like um, some efforts at you know, something like, for want of a better word, the Hindu version of a Christian Sunday school, hmm. something for children. Vivekananda himself spoke to small gatherings of children. So did Abhidhananji here on a regular systematic uh, basis. And they were, remember, they were, there was literally no Indian diaspora here at that time. They were all American kids. They were all Christians at that time. Um, so it's not just a Vedanta society. If you look at all the other teachers who have come here up to the 1950s and 60s until the beginnings of the Indian diaspora growing fast. Um, all of them were primarily directed at uh, grown-ups, at yeah. adults, at people who were interested in, in yoga, in uh, Vedanta, so on, meditation. Um, so that's one. But the second... Uh, challenge is when the large numbers of uh, Indians have come, the Indian diaspora is large and incre increasing fast in India, uh, in, in the United States. Now the question comes, why? what about the community as such? There also there doesn't seem to be much that's happening. It's some To some extent it's the immigrant experience where they all say you lose the one generation. <laughs> the parents are <laughs> very Indian. They come and settle down here. They struggle. The children grow up very alienated and Often they want to move away from the Indian roots. I mean, they grow up in an environment which is uh, except home, except their strange father and mother who are really uncool. Uh, everything else is uh, American. So at the first uh, chance they get, they try to move away from that strange aspect of their lives and they become very American. But then in that generation also, and in succeeding, succeeding generations, there's often a great interest in roots. Clearly, right. they find themselves different from others. They would like to know what is it that is unique to them. And I have seen, there's a whole phenomenon of first, the second generation kids growing up here in the Indian diaspora, and their kind of Hinduism, the ones who are interested. Right. That's, I mean, that's a whole new movement and very good, actually. Um, so one last point here. The, it's the why they did not have uh, you know, regular education programs like Jewish children do, like Muslim children do, like uh, many Christian children do. If you notice the, the Hindu Hinduism has often been located within its geography for thousands of years. Sure. It's never been meant for export as such. So except for Southeast Asia was very deeply Hindu, right? From from the beginning yeah, to the true, common true. era. All throughout the Hindu culture has spread. <laughs> Yeah. even from pre-Buddhistic times, I think, and right. during Buddhistic times. However, if you say education programs for children, if you look at India, in India also we don't have education programs for children <laughs> in, in general. The reason is you sort of catch it rather than learn it. It's more like an osmosis in India. You're surrounded right. by Hinduism. Right. And, and parents don't have much of an anxiety about it either. If you learn good, if you don't learn, that's also sort of all right. In fact, if you learn too much, the parents become ang anxious. Is this person is going to be a religious <laughs> nut or become a monk or something? <laughs> uh, now, what has the co community done in response to what they see happening to their children here in the United States? One is um, there are institutions, not so much us, but something like the Chinmay Mission, Bal Viharas, which are very successful across the United. I met so many second generation Hindus here who went to those Bal Viharas. And so uh, almost everything they know about Hinduism comes from there. That's one. One institution I would like to mention is, which is allied to us, it's something called the Vivekananda Vidyapit. It's mm -hmm. right here in New Jersey. And 600 kids of uh, uh, Indian origin from grade one to grade 10 
they go there for um, Saturday, Sunday classes. They have their own um, building, their own facilities. And the, and the teachers are the parents themselves who, like most Indians here, tend to be very well-educated, well-off right. professionals. So they teach the children. Uh, and it, it's a really wonderful institution. Uh, it's been being run for the last 40 years. It's one of a kind, but it's something that can be replicated. No, it's, uh, Kinder, do you have any follow-ups to that? No, I, I, I had the same question. Um, I, the one um, thing I wanted to mention is growing up as a first-generation Indian in this country, I think a pattern that a lot of us have is we're ashamed about our culture. And uh, the Western perspective, oh, you're a pagan, idol-worshipping people. There's so many misunderstandings about Hinduism. Even the, the accusation that, it, that we worship multiple gods and things like that. It, uh, so one thing I wanted to ask you about, Swamiji, is when you're dealing with Manhattan, New York, um, what are the big misunderstandings uh, you get about Vedanta? And uh, do, would you like to address any of those major misunderstandings you feel right now? Um, major misunderstandings? Uh, well, like you mentioned, the thing about idolatry, yeah. And think about multiple gods. But there's another thing also, which is uh, more common nowadays. These charges you, you talked about, they are as old as uh, the history of uh, uh, you know Western interaction with India. But yeah. right now, there's another uh, aspect to it, which is just plain ignorance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not that they are well trained in their uh, in a Christian paradigm, and from that they're looking with suspicion at at Hindus, which was the case for um, for you know uh, since Vivekananda came. And uh, right. but last one or two generations, lot of Am Americans, especially in these uh, more affluent, well-off coastal areas, the Pacific Coast and Atlantic Coast. You will find lots of people who have been brought up in an agnostic or atheistic uh, environment. Yeah. It's yeah. not that they are very rooted Christians or who are very um, looking suspiciously at Hindus. No, um, they don't know much about Christianity. And of course, they know even less about Hinduism. Hmm. So that's that's another challenge. Yes. Um, so the old thing about idolatry, it might be there in the trained clergy, in people who are committed Christians. But in general, among the public, I don't think it's, it's, an, it's much of an issue at all anymore these days. It was a big issue in India itself in the late 19th century. You find people coming to Sri Ramakrishna and asking him, um, is it right to worship images under the impact of uh, the British rule? Calcutta was the colonial capital in those days. So is it good to worship images or not? Vivekananda had a straightforward, characteristically straightforward answer to all of that. He said, uh, if image worship can produce one like Ramakrishna, worship a thousand images, I say. <laughs> it's... Um, to some extent, Hinduism has been unapologetic about it. Even uh, So it's someone like Sri Ramakrishna who comes right there in the cusp of those reform movement, the Brahma Samaj and the others uh, uh, in the North, North India, the Arya Samaj, they all wanted to do away with um, image worship because it was a kind of a colonial impact. Yeah. Sri Ramakrishna was unapologetically <laughs> an image worshipper uh, from the beginning of his sadhana in Dakshineshwar Kali temple till the final days also. he there At no point did he say that uh, I will not go to the temple now. I've gone uh, above and beyond image worship. No, he was always deeply, deeply reverential. He even persuaded his Advaita guru, uh, Totapuri, Totapuri. Yeah. Uh, to come to the Kali temple and bow down. Finally, that was the resolution. Um, Totapuri, when Sri Ramakrishna would say, and let me go and ask my mother so the priest first thought he meant his biological mother, <laughs> but then when he re realized this, he was slightly derisive of uh, of worshiping this image of Kali, uh, and he ended up acknowledging Kali. Um, so, uh, yeah, multiple gods again. I don't get much of that. It's it's not very difficult to explain. Um, it's more general ignorance about Hinduism. And also a process of actually educating people in what is what is it that Vedanta is all about. Not just Advaita mm -hmm. Vedanta. The spiritual quest, the quest for moksha is right. something well understood in India. Uh, 
there are many, many words for it and it's as old as history, whether it's moksha, nirvana, kaivalya, apavarga, whatever you call it. That has been a huge project of Indian civilization. Not so here. What is exactly the purpose of religion, of spirituality? There's a spiritual hunger, but there, there's no clear label to it. What is it that they right. seek? That education. It's often mixed up with a little bit of worldliness. Yes, so peace of mind, um, tuning up my relationship problems, uh, so all of this. and Efficiency at work, <laughs> non-stress yes. life. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And it's all mixed up together. Yeah. So, yeah. There's so, a nice anecdote. I don't know how true it is. Apocryphal, uh, probably, of uh, uh, Maharshi Mahesh Yogi. When he came and started teaching meditation, which finally became the Transcendental Meditation Movement, uh, right here in New York, when he went back, one of the first visits back to India, it seems some of his brother monks asked him, what is it that you are teaching? Be here, you're telling them, you know, if you meditate, you, you, the aging will slow down, you won't have wrinkles, <laughs> you, you won't have disease, you'll look good, uh, you, will, you won't have stress. That's not the purpose of meditation. Meditation of pur uh, purpose of meditation is God realization, enlightenment. Yeah. Um, so Maharshi Mahesh Yogi uh, so is supposed to have replied that uh, I give them what they want in the hope that they will want what I want to give them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this is important. I, I think it's like the value. Is, so one of the questions I, I'll, I'll ask is, so generally when the despite the ignorance, put the ignorance in size, there's this overwhelming sense with a lot of the West that India is this mystic, esoteric, Hindu is this mystic, esoteric, world-denying like kind of mentality, right? Like this idea that we want to break free of the world, this world is suffering, and so on, right? Um, but, you know, what's always struck me is when you read any of our texts, right, uh, from the Vedas to Mahabharata all the way down, the very core of our existence is yagya, this engagement with the world and living in the world and being of the world. And dharma, right, the very foundation of dharma, 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 is the maintenance of society. So how do you address this pull towards moksha, this, this salvation, mukti, whatever you want to call it, and this desire to live and be in this world and engage with it? How would you, like the Pravritti Nivritti Marga? Yeah. I think one has to take a closer look at it. The distinction is not as uh, uh, simple as we may, we may think it is. You see, every religion, in order to be a genuine religion, has to, be, to, has to turn away from the world. You cannot have a worldly religion, quote-unquote. Religion and worldly, they don't go together. There is something that transcends the world. After all, what's the definition of a religion? Religion must have some transcendent component at its core. If it does not have a transcendent comp component, then it's not a religion. That's why science is not a religion. That's why communism is not a religion. You know, it, the, communism, for example, shares many of the characteristics of a, of a religion. But it's not a religion because it's all about just this world and nothing transcendent beyond it. So every religion must have a transcendent aspect and that must be the core of it. Otherwise, it's not a religion. Uh, whether it's an Abrahamic religion or Indian or, or Chinese religion, whatever it is, there must be something transcendent. Now, you can do one of two things with the transcendent thing. You may turn away from the world what the transcendence implies entirely and seek the transcendent alone. And the emphasis can become uh, very otherworldly or unworldly. And that, can, that has happened in India. It can become extremely monastic, um, so, like Jainism, Buddhism, where some some strands of Hinduism were, or you can take the transcendent and bring it back to the world. Vivekananda put it very powerfully. This is an extremely important key to understanding Hinduism. He says, "We Hindus worship a transcendent, immanent God." So the reality which we are worshiping, just like every religion, there is a uh, which we seek. There is a transcendent reality. By transcendent, I mean beyond the senses, beyond this um, world. In fact, even more deeply, beyond time, space, and causation, beyond Maya, so to say. There is a reality. And we call it uh, Brahman, Atman, Bhagawan, whatever you call it. But that same reality is here. This world, within time, space, and causation. This world which we experience with our senses. This world which we experience as subject and object. Which we experience as society. 
What is this? This is the manifestation of the same divinity. So in every school of Hinduism, the reality is not only transcendent, but it's in and through creation. It is also immanent. Um, this creation is uh, supported by Brahman, uh, is pervaded by Brahman. Not just in Advaita Vedanta, in every school of Vedanta, in every school of Tantra. Uh, so we Hindus worship a transcendent, immanent divinity. Look at, I just say this and stop. Uh, look, look at the goal, for example, in Advaita Vedanta. The goal is uh, uh, Jivan Mukti. There you have your answer. You realize you are Brahman utterly beyond this world of names and forms. But where are you Brahman? As a Jivan Mukta in this body, in this personality, uh, as uh, Mukunda, uh, and uh, realizing your nature as limitless existence, consciousness, bliss, and yet living Mukunda's life. In this world, yeah, that was the idea. That was the idea. It's very interesting because you know, like the Jivan Mukti concept is very important within the Vedic traditions, but it's not found in you know Vishesh Advaita and Advaita, right, uh, or regular Advaita and so on. The idea that one can be freed of your embodiedness in the body is very, I think, different for these for these other traditions because you yes. can, while well, you can have that experience of Brahman continually, as long as one is still bound. To the sum, to the uh, the uh, the pancha indriyas and the trigunas and all this stuff, you're still su suffering the consequences of that until the freedom. I mean, Absolutely. that's the, their view. Yeah, but even in Vishishta Dvaita, it is one achit achit Vishishta Brahma. This yeah. entire world of sentient beings and insentient reality is pervaded through and through. It's a part of the yes. body of God, so to so to say. So yeah. you are always living immersed in divinity right, yeah. right in it so the, it's not that you become truly spiritual once you get out of this life and go there right. if, if, especially if you contrast it to the issues which have continuously risen in abrahamic religions uh -huh. especially in islam of uh, the con continuous conflict between the transcendent aspect of the uh, of the almighty god and this creation right uh, what exactly is the relationship and it has led to a lot of anxiety uh, in, in those religious traditions because they have this whole feeling of idolatry. Right. You try to make it too immanent. Oh, it's idolatry. You're worshipping the <laughs> world. You're not worshipping God. If you make it completely transcendent as some have, in that case, what is the status of this world? It's something to be discarded, gotten rid of as soon right. as possible. It's, <laughs> yeah. No, but that's, but, but that's very interesting because like, I, I think this immanence transcendence thing is is always a tug of war, right? Even within our own traditions of like Dwaita really wants to emphasize the transcendent the transcendence of God, right? But it, it can't let go that he's also imminent. So you have like the, the sakshat uh element of of, of 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 Vishnu playing out in Dwaita philosophy. So it, it, I think it's this very deep like India does uh, the or Indic thought really does not like the binaries and wants to make them one but yeah. it can't it can't let go of the binaries meaning like it, it has to deal with it somehow yes and that defines how these uh, one of the reasons why these different schools came up yeah Dvaita, Vishishta, Dvaita, Dvaita, they all have different answers to that uh, same question one great scholar of Dvaita Vedanta um Varkhedi Srinivas Varkhedi uh, he uh, he gave this I don't know where he got it from or he came up with it himself, but very nice answer how these different, um, um, very different systems yeah. come to different metaphysical, epistemological, uh, soteriological uh, uh, conclusions. They can emerge from the same set of texts, the Upanishads. So if hmm. you ask, depending on the question that you ask, his, uh, his, his take on it, Srinivas Varkedi, is that if you ask the question to the Upanishads, what is real and what is false? you get Advaita Vedanta. The answer that you'll get will finally become the system of Advaita Vedanta. If you ask the question, what is whole and what is part? And then mm. you will get the system of Vishishta Advaita Vedanta. And if you ask the question, what is independent and what is dependent, you will get the system of Madhva Vedanta or Advaita Vedanta. That's, that's an interesting take on it. Yeah, absolutely. So, Swamiji, so um, I heard um, Medananda discussed was Sri Ramakrishna an Advaitin? Was he a Vishishta Advaitin? And he comes up with a new category of Zignana Zignana Advaita. Is that can you just explain what that is? Because that's like a synthesis of everything in some sense, right? True. Well, you will have to ask him because it's uh, somehow, <laughs> it's, it's like a, a cutting edge work which he he is doing, and yeah. this is the term that he has been pushing and trying to popularize. 
but he's on to yeah. something so uh, is it another uh, school of vedanta we don't know yet but i don't think so mm. uh, and he also agrees that uh, if you look at sri ramakrishna's approach it seems to be more of a meta approach um, it's not one more school of vedanta which will supersede or replace the other schools of vedanta which vie for supremacy among each other rather uh, take take a step back and see where all 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 of these schools are coming from and how they can all be true. What was important for Sri Ramakrishna was harmony. Mm. So his famous teaching of as many faiths, so many paths, and that he came through uh, by a mystical process of of experiencing the divine in various ways: um, the limitlessness of the divine, the ineffability of the divine, and the efficacy of various paths of experience, of uh, spiritual practice leading to the to, to the same divine. Um, mm. These are the components of what is Ayan Maharaj now he's calling it Vigyana Vedanta. Mm. Uh, yeah. But you should do a full program on that. I will. <laughs> so you know what's interesting is uh that's also the project of like the epistemology of like you know Paradvaita of Kashmir Shaivism, right? It's it's an attempt to also hold all positions within its its framework. And, yeah. to, it, and and I feel so even Vedanteshka and, and various other scholars and other traditions, this is one thing I find very beautiful across the Hindu framework is that even the attempt to even somehow include Buddhism and Jainism within their uh, epistemological understanding of somehow we're all talking about the same thing, but how are we talking about it, right? And they're all trying to explain, well, they're trying to say my, my position is correct, ultimately, mm -hmm. Well, they're also saying, but you're not all wrong in, in completely. There's something right about what you're saying, too. So there's this yes, engagement yes. with each other that I think is very unique. Absolutely. From the most ancient times uh, till today. Um, and this becomes very clear when you contrast it with what happened in the Middle East with the, in, the, in the you know the birth and the growth of the Abrahamic religions. Sure. So um, all the way back to the Rig Vedic, Ekam Sad Vipra Bahuda Vadanti. The truth is one. The wise speak of it differently. And that was the crucial point uh, in the evolution of Hinduism and the post-Hindu religions also. You know, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, and so on, so on and so forth. They all shared the same worldview. Um, so, and they did it in different ways. Uh, one was, I think it's called this doxographical method, that these are all different systems of thought. Yes. And you learn those systems of thought. Yes, your system of thought is the superior one. You have got a deeper understanding. and But then it's upon you to show how it is a deeper understanding. At no point do we come across any category like this is heretical. All of these people are going to go to hell. Um, they have to be destroyed. And then we bring political, military power to bring to bear on that and destroy it. And think that this work of destroying the other is part of my um, my religious duties. Yeah. That kind of thing, never, never, ever. I, I often say in India, India was not a peaceful place. There were kingdoms rising and falling, empires fighting. But you have not one example, not one example of a war fought for religion. Not a peaceful place, lots of wars, lots of empires and kingdoms, and not and, and a very religious place. The people, uh, religious passions ran high. And right. curiously, and thankfully, Nobody got the idea that we can make this a cause of war. Right. Let's go and destroy our neighboring kingdoms and convert them to our religion. Kings patronized certain um, religions from time to time, but they never converted in, into a theology of warfare against others, of uh, conversion, destruction, homogenization. No. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, entirely throughout history, until the coming of Islamic invaders in the uh, end of the first millennium, this concept of a mass scale religious war, never there in India. Um, so, um, uh, there were different ways in which this was mediated. For example, the Wada, the debate, huh? uh, a feature of uh, Hindu thought, of Indian thought since the most ancient times. Extraordinary uh, that these schools would engage in intellectual gladiatorial uh, uh, combat <laughs> instead of taking it leaving it uh, to the hands of mobs or uh, soldiers or politicians. Uh, the whole engagement was intellectual. Mm -hmm. You were expected to master those other systems 
if you really wanted to propagate your system, you would have to master those other systems. Then you would have to engage in debate with them and the whole system of debate came up they have rules for that such beautiful rules for debate for example you would have to um i would have to repeat back to you your position what you said i would have to repeat back to you to your satisfaction only when you agree that yes that's what i said then only i have a right to start my reply uh -huh. uh, that's so great you know like most uh, yeah the purva paksha, yeah, the poor is... paksha. Yeah. Uh, but you see most debates most arguments end up fighting because the people, they're not really listening to the other person. I'm waiting to, and you know, I'm going to say this to what you're right. saying. So there are many such rules. And there's a whole intricate system of debate and all sort of because luckily they shared a common Sanskrit culture and a Sanskrit language. Even when they were completely outside the Vedic fold, they were mm -hmm. Buddhists and Jains, but they debated and they wrote in the same language. They responded to each other. They influenced each other to, the, to such an extent you can find Buddhist DNA, DNA in Advaitic texts. You can find Advaitic ideas. You can find Vedantic ideas in Buddhist and uh, Jaina texts. So this was one way. Another way, distinct way, which they dealt with was um, the Jaina way of um, the Syadvad. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's unique to Jainism. Uh, so all of these are points of view. It goes back to their idea, Ananta Dharma Kam Vastu. Reality has limitless aspects. So since it has limitless aspects, your view of reality, if you make a really good attempt, you are capturing some aspects of it. And so you are not wrong. And to support that, that's the beauty of the Jaina philosophers, to support this kind of a harmony, non-violence in philosophy, let's say, non-violence in religion and philosophy uh, at the intellectual level, to support that, to prevent it from becoming incoherent, they developed a multi-valued logic. Yeah. I mean, in the modern world, Europe did not have multi-valued logics until the 19th, late 19th century, mid 19th century. They began to have, in 20th century, multi-valued logics. They had a seven-valued logic going back 2,000 years and well-developed. Yeah. Um, so, and that has been the history all through. There are many ways in which different uh, viewpoints were accommodated. Until we come to Sri Ramakrishna, but maybe I can talk about that later. Yeah, absolutely. So let's come to Sri Ramakrishna. So, like, what what was appealing to you about Sri Ramakrishna's uh, philosophy and and life that drew you to want to stay within this tradition and 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 yes. accept it? One interesting thing about Sri Ramakrishna, what struck uh, strikes you is how Hindu he is. Mm. He comes from a little village to Calcutta, which is the epicenter of, um, of the British Empire in India and the introduction of you know, Christianity through Christian missionaries uh, and modern thought um, through English uh, universities and colleges and all. And he comes to it every inch a Hindu, completely uh, unaffected by the colonial influences. And uh, he has is only one point agenda in his life. God and God. He's a, somebody called him a God intoxicated soul. So experience, God experience and God next came God experience in so many ways, not just his beloved mother Kali but also in a Vaishnava way, prolonged sadhana in uh, uh, Vaishnavism um, then you know, Krishna Bhakti and then uh, uh, the Tantric way and then the Advaita Vedanta teacher who came, and all of these different ways. And then spreading out further, his curiosity about God knew no bounds. Somebody called him a glutton for God. <laughs> so how do the Christians, these white Englishmen, how do they worship God? I want to see. How do the Muslims worship God? And not only learn about it, actually try to experience. He was very experiential. So uh, trying to experience God in that way. And when he would do that, he would not be syncretic. He would... When he, he did his Muslim Sufi sadhana, he, uh, this, uh, he removed the, all Hindu gods and goddesses, the pictures and every symbol of Hinduism. He dressed like, he changed his dhoti to wear the dhoti like uh, um, the Muslims in Bengal wear it. And he prayed like a Muslim. So he would, today we would call it a kind of phenomenological immersion mm. into each tradition, not trying to mix and match. But the conclusion he came to was his, entirely his own. He, he was a genius in that way. 
the experiences he had, he said he clearly saw all of them leading to the same highest experience. Mm -hmm. So he com comes to this conclusion, Jato Mot Tatopot, as many fates, so many paths. Um, so the utter, the, the, this thing that God is real, that speaks like a blazing sun from Sri Ramakrishna, that God is real, God can be experienced, not only experienced, that's the whole purpose of human life, whether you know it or not, that's what we are all searching for. And it can be experienced in various ways. All these paths of, see, that's what he does. He takes all of Hinduism along with him. And not mm. only all of Hinduism, he takes all of human civilization along with him. His view of human civilization is all these civilizations through their religions um, have been trying to find God. That has been the highest project of every civilization across the world. That is, you know, the quintessence of the human project, according to him. The goal of human life is God realization. And it is possible. It's for everybody. In fact, everybody is trying to do it. Most of us are trying to do it unknowingly, chasing money or relationships or power, pleasure. Um, in whichever way we're trying to seek fulfillment, basically unknowingly we are trying to reach for that infinite. Um, so that was one side of, uh, of it. The other side, his many-sidedness. You want bhakti, it's there. You want jnana, it's there. You want meditation, it's there. You want the various schools of Hinduism, Advaita, Advaita, Vishishta, Advaita. It's all there and all supported by him, that all entirely encouraged by him. That you, yes, this is good and pursue it in all sincerity and you will reach God in this very life. Why not? Um, all on the basis of the strictest uh, um, ethical life mm -hmm. uh, and a, a high standard of ethics and morality. Uh, a very human person also. It's not a deity in a temple to be worshipped. We have temples to Sri Ramakrishna now. But if you see the uh, you know, the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna, the conversations, very human, full of uh, humor and fun and um, understanding human life from A to Z, uh, as M Americans would uh, put it. So, yeah, all of these, these are uh, different aspects which attracted me. Yeah, I, I love the fact that you pointed out, I think on pretty every single page of the, the Gospel of Ramakrishna, there's laughter and there's yes. a joy and everyone breaks out in laughter. That happens on every page. And you know what? Yes. For some reason, most people in my generation, their idea of religion is very serious and somber and yes. laughing and things are not accepted. But that's what drew me to Ramakrishna is he has a great sense of humor. <laughs> and, and all throughout, he, he doesn't take anything very seriously, including himself uh, and uh all throughout, not only him, but his followers. Vivekananda himself was uh, uh, could be uproariously funny. Somebody so, here. So, Swamiji, why do you think that most people, they have this notion of religion is very uh, serious? Why has that become the most... Uh, like, even in the Catholic Mass, if you laugh, it's considered very disrespectful and everything. everyone must be serious. Why has this happened to religion in the world, huh? Uh, because, <laughs> because it is serious. There's no doubt about it. It's the most <laughs> serious endeavor that we have in, in life. And now yeah. they try to make it sacrosanct and reverential. I guess the way most people would do it would keep, you know, uh, laughter out of it. Keep, mm. uh, but and the end you make it a joyless affair. Uh -huh. mm. Yeah. Uh, and, and many many things have happened in the West. For example, it's um, uh, emphasis on doctrinal purity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so mm. this is right and this is wrong. Uh, it's also to some extent, I think, the influence of the Roman Empire on the Christian Church. I think the early Christian church was a little different. Uh, Christianity itself also, uh, the way it came was a, a very uh, deeply spiritual, deeply otherworldly, unworldly. Don't look at what Christian Christians say these days, especially here in the West. Uh, I mean, it's very clear to me that in the last 200 years, Christianity has changed track. I wouldn't say it's lost its way, but... Uh, uh, you continuously lose the essence of uh, what it is, uh, uh, the spiritual essence. But then the influence of the Roman Empire on the um, Christian Church, which brought with it ceremonials and uh, you know the Roman law and rigidities mm. and hierarchy and all of that. I guess there are many reasons why it's become like that. Uh, mm. but, but, uh, yeah, the, the, contem the contemplative tradition, are you referring to someone like St. Teresa of Avila or Sir Thomas Merton? Like those type of people, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, not Sir Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton now. Uh, the, yes. The, you know, yeah. Uh, and St. Teresa uh, Avila. And, yeah, so they were genuinely deeply spiritual people. Mm -hmm. uh, and they could be uh, humorous also in their own way. 
so humor as an expression of joy of uh, and of of a very high kind of joy um so there's a telling incident when somebody asked vivekananda that should you be making fun of sri ramakrishna he was joking about <laughs> sri ramakrishna sometime after sri ramakrishna had passed and then vivekananda turned on that gentleman and said so should i joke about you <laughs> meaning meaning thereby whatever i do whether i'm joking about it talking about it discussing debating fighting about it it's always the highest it's always the highest spiritual thoughts philosophical thoughts well but here's the thing right like when 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 you know um when you know the uh aesthetic theory like rasa theory right the, the hasya is a very hasya. important yeah, it's a very important yeah. element in, in in aesthetics but aesthetics purpose is to get one to 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 know the atma itself through these these bhavas that lead to rasas, right? So I, I think it's interesting that I think historically within the the Hindu framework, even if actually with Mahabharata itself, there's a lot of funny moments throughout it, despite the fact that it's a grave story. They, like even the Harivam Shah, like the way Krishna acts as a child, and you see there's just this joy in, in all of this. Right. And that comes from our view of the ultimate reality. It's such yeah. chit ananda, existence, consciousness, bliss. Uh, have you noticed one thing that when you go back to these all these old spiritual philosophical traditions in India, if you go back mm. two thousand to three thousand years back, they're all very similar. If you take Buddhism, Jain, what is the goal? Purpose is to transcend suffering. Suffering is a condition of human life, and the goal is to set oneself and others free of suffering. That's what Buddhism wants to do. That's what um, Jainism wants to do. That's what in Hinduism also. Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Sankhya, uh, Yoga, all of them are pretty similar that way. Uh, these are certain practices which are philosophical and meditative based on ethics and they will take you beyond suffering. That sort of, that's a type that covers the entire gamut of, you know, running from Jainism to Buddh early Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, yeah. to Sankhya, Yoga, um, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, um, and, um, um, you know, um, the, the uh, so so all of this entire range. Yet, if you go a little further back to the Upanishads themselves, you come across again and again references to Ananda. Mm -hmm. The goal is overcoming suffering, but attainment of fulfillment or attainment of bliss. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are debates in the philosophical schools in uh, Sankhya, for example, in uh, Nyaya, whether the ultimate reality Atman is Ananda or not. So hmm. the idea is that it's always um, overcoming of suffering. It's probably not a positive ananda. That's what they came to, even the Buddhist, early Buddhists at least. But you go back to the Upanishads, it's all ananda. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And so a joyless uh, religion is something wrong there. But but I, I think I think the difference ah. is like you know, dukkha and sukha versus ananda is, is transcendent. It's something that's yes. beyond the, the 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 happiness and, and joy we get in everyday life. There's something that's even beyond that. It's, it encompasses it, but it's something that's beyond, I think, is... Yeah. One thing you'll notice, one yeah. great proof is actually spi actual spiritual people. Those ah. you would consider, you know, we don't know who is enlightened, but yeah. you generally have sense of somebody who has been uh, genuinely trying this and is fairly well along and, and uh, you know, a senior practitioner. One thing you will find common to all of them, not just, I'm just not talking about uh, Veda, Advaita Vedanta or across all traditions in Hinduism and indeed across all spiritual traditions across the world, they are joyful people. Yeah. Uh -huh. They are happy yeah. people. They are generally not complaining, grumbling people. They, I, I often joke that if you want to be spiritual, well, be careful. You'll lose your right to whine. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to stop grumbling. Uh, uh, Saint Teresa, you mentioned Saint Teresa. She yes, said, please. The turtle. Uh, she uh, said, going back in the turtle shell, right? Going back into the turtle shell. She has an yeah. analogy like that. So beautiful. Please tell me about it. Yes. The, the Saint Teresa, uh, she said, uh, a sad nun is a bad nun. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. spe speaking of Ra Sri Ramakrishna, again, you know, I love the idea of those different types of relationship with God, you know, Vatsalya Bhava, Mathura Bhava. Can you just discuss those different types of bhava? Because I feel like he went through all of them. And what's yes. fascinating for me, even in Christianity, we worship baby Jesus. We yes. have Bala Krishna, right? right? And so there's so many similar ways of worshiping God. But can you just go over those bhavas for our listeners? Because I yes. found it to be very fascinating. 
Um, Yes. Uh, one thing before I go into that, the question of laughter. You mentioned the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Almost every other sure. page, there's there's all yeah, laugh, Asya. all laugh. He was hilariously <laughs> funny. Um, there are descriptions of people rolling on the floor with laughter and yeah. clutching their bellies. They, they can't stop yeah, laughing yeah. so much. Um, now, the the story goes years later, decades later, uh, when the main monastery at Belur had been established, Sri Ramakrishna had passed and Vivekananda had passed. But the senior disciples of Sri Ramakrishna were still there. A group of young monks, one evening, um, they're sitting in a room on the bank of the Ganga and talking and joking and laughing rather loudly. The next room, Swami Turiyananda, who was a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, a very strict Vedantist, a very great monk of, um, you know, the first generation of monks of our order. He comes storming in and he said, what's there for you youngsters to laugh about? Have you realized God and have you attained enlightenment? why are you so what's there to be so happy about then they felt silent but one of them plucked up courage and he said but Swami if you permit me in the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna when we read Sri Ramakrishna is talking and everybody around him every now and then they burst out laughing and you were there among them <laughs> Swami Turiyananda was a young boy Hari who was in that group too so Turiyananda ji he immediately smiles and he nods you're right you're right be joyful be joyful <laughs> you're right <laughs> is, Turiya, yes. is, is swami turiyananda also the one who said at the when he passed when he was leaving his body uh, brahma satyam jagat satyam is yes that... yes he's the one who all his life said brahma satyam jagat mitya jagat mitya yeah so can you say a little bit about that before we go yeah. to the bala ask, Swam, ask swami medhananda he's the resident expert on that <laughs> because he sort of based his uh, insight yeah, of Vigyana vedanta this is a very important insight um, uh, I just say that it's not a repudiation of Advaita Vedanta. Uh, uh, right. uh, it's uh, it's I would say building a superstructure on the basis of Advaita Vedanta. Got it. Um, all right, the bhavas uh -huh. in in Hinduism in Vedanta, the approach is to humanize our relationship with the divine and divinize our relationships with human beings with all uh -huh. living beings. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. To see the divinity in all beings, if it's an immanent reality then the God you love, worship, adore must be present in everybody. Mm. Regardless of what the mask is, the one behind the mask is, is the face of God. Even so, Vladimir Putin, right? It has to be. It has to be. The more you realize... See, why we, we find it difficult? Somebody said to me in the Harvard Divinity School, a grad student, I don't like the your Vedantic approach because it means uh, Mother Teresa and Adolf Hitler are both you know equally divine in some sense. Why we find that difficult to swallow is our view of ourselves is how we view everybody else. If I see myself as a body primarily, no matter what I say, but I literally feel I'm this body, I will think of everybody as bodies. More uh, realistically, if I see myself as a person, as almost every one of us does, I see myself as a person, I'll see the others as persons. A person is basically a mind. You know, certain conditioning, certain culture, certain memories, certain narratives, certain thoughts, certain emotions. And persons can clearly be good persons and bad persons can clearly be that now what Advaita Vedanta is saying is that you are not a person it's an impersonal reality you are this one limitless radiance shining through these apertures called persons and as you shine through the mind of a particular personality it can take on the color of an evil personality a monster like uh, Adolf Hitler or a saint but the reality is not the mask. Person, by the way, the word person I came to know to my delight persona. means mask. Yeah, yeah. yeah persona. Mask. It was a yeah, mask yeah. which the Greek performers used to put on and speak through it. So persona, um, sounding through that mask. Anyway, so it's a mask. There is a divine reality which is beyond that mask. And that's true of everybody. It's um, true of each of us. It's true of every sentient being. Uh, it's in fact even true of non-sentient, what we think of as non-living just matter there is a divinity behind behind means not literally physically behind it as a deeper reality of that um so divinize our relationship with the human beings everybody is that divine reality but then of course the question of how do you deal with different persons and common sense sri ramakrishna had a, had a dictum he says in bengali bhakta habit habit boka habi kano to be a bhakta you don't have to be a fool in bengali the word boka means fool boka. you have yeah. You have to be intelligent. You have to use all your common sense, intelligence and understanding to deal with the situation. Um, then this other aspect of it is 
to humanize our relationship with the divine. Mm. So that impersonal Brahman, which is as non-human as you can get, a limitless being, a limitless awareness, um, that you relate to it as a human being. And your most dear, most emotionally charged human relationships. So it could be the servant-master relationship. Hanuman. Hanuman. Yeah. So it starts with a non-charged relationship, which is called a Shanta Bhava, the peaceful, the serene attitude. If you want to put Advaita Vedanta in this typology, you would probably put it in the serene attitude. It was said to be the attitude of the Rishis of the Upanishads. Um, they are not singing and dancing, but they are, mm. they, they are serenely contemplating the divine Brahman, Shanta Bhava. Shanta Bhava. Yeah. Then you have the attitude of the master and servant. You, the Lord, you are my master and I am thy servant. Typically, Hanuman is a classic example of that. Um, the Hanuman Chalisa, which millions of Indians. And now I found to my amazing amazement thousands of Americans here. Oh, Hanuman yeah, yeah, is somehow yeah. popular. <laughs> I think thanks to Krishna Das, thanks to Neem Karoli Baba, and so on, there are whole movements dedicated to Hanuman here. Yes, yes. Um, I know this American lady, um, a redhead Hollywood, but with a harmonium, she goes on singing the uh, Hanuman Chalisa. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, um, so, um, this is Hanuman Gyanagun Sagar. This is Ramakaja Kari Veko Atura. So, uh, eager, passionate about doing, actually doing something for the Lord. Not just loving the Lord or contemplating or meditating or repeating a mantra. Actually going out there and doing something. Can I do something for you? There's a servant attitude to the Lord. And I think many of our monks, uh, we have that attitude towards uh, God, that we, the Lord is our master and we are servants. What is the Sanskrit then, name for that attitude? Dasya Bhava. Shanta is a Dasya Bhava. Then the third one would be the uh, Sakya, uh, the, uh, 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 that is Friendship. Sakha. Sakha. Uh, Sakha. If it is a, a woman, then Sakhi, but sak, um, this friendship, like Arjuna and Krishna, mm -hmm. like Uddhava. And uh, uh, and Krishna, uh, so Sudama mm -hmm. and Krishna, for example. Uh, so they have this relationship of friendship. Mm -hmm. so this is where you you don't think you are a servant. You think God is my buddy. I have found a monk in the Himalayas who used to call God Mera Yar. <laughs> no, but a, a lot of people do that, right? Call God instead of the like thum, you say tu and. No, it's, yes. it's a very like informal relationship. Right. The Lord, Aap, Thou, is preliminary. In Hinduism, we feel as love increases, as intimacy increases, you become more, uh, the the awesome aspect of God diminishes. Which for, in the Gita, right? So like he says, hey, Krishna, hey, Yadava, hey, Saka. Yeah. You know, like after he sees the Vishwa Rupam, yes. he's like, he, he his, his pretense of this, his understanding of his relationship with, that absolute that suddenly becomes this man in front of you that you've been kicking and you've been playing with and you've been hanging out with and saying, friend, you're you're in awe of suddenly. And that maybe that's the next thing. Yes. Level. And and yeah. that conception was shattered. Yeah. when he suddenly saw the awesome form of the Lord. But then you see uh, the he Let's asked for it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Arjun asked for it. He said he prayed for it at the beginning of the eleventh chapter. Yeah. Can you show me this? I believe what you have said that you are the God of this universe and you are immanent in this universe. You manifest as this universe. All of that I believe. But can I actually experience it? Because I'm still seeing you as this blue hued person in standing in front of me who is driving my chariot. Yeah. And then he shows him the Vishwarupa, the cosmic form of God. But the result of that is Arjuna is scared. He's terrified. And he wants the human form back again. He prays for it. And then the human form comes back. So that human relationship, God is my friend. And then there's an even more charged, emotionally charged, more intense version of it, uh, which is God is my child. Vatsalya Bhava. So the baby Krishna, the baby Rama, the baby Jesus. The reason why you have that form is now it's not you serving a master. Now it's not you playing with your friend. Now 
you are the superior. God is your inferior because it's God is a helpless child whom you have to take care of. So all that you are doing all day long is taking care of God. And that is a um, you do not ask for boons from the baby. You just love and take care of the baby and enjoy the presence of the baby. So the, the Lord is your is your baby. Uh, that's the vatsalya. You could be the father to God. You could be the mother, especially to God, Yashoda and others. A variation of this would be God is the parent and I am the child. Uh, this is a sort of offshoot of that where the whole Christian, Judeo-Christian idea of God as father in heaven, um, a fatherly figure. Or a mother, as in Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna's attitude to God was, I am the child and you are my mother. Kali is my mother. That was his sort of default approach. Though he did practice the Vatsalya Bhava also with Ram Lala, with the little uh, image of Rama, which became living for him. And uh, he uh, he was like the mother for, for Rama. Then finally, you have the highest of all Bhavas, the Madhura Bhava, the attitude of the beloved. The Lord is my lover. Jai Deva. So, yep, Jai Deva. Um, Radha, uh, the epitome is Radha, but also the other gopis. And it does not matter whether you're a man or a woman. I have seen a man, very much a man, you know, a tall, well-built person, but thinks of himself as this gopi, this woman who loves Krishna. And it's a sadhana for that person. It's a deep, intensive sadhana. And these are the higher reaches of Vaishnava sadhana, uh, which are there. And there are texts for this. There are spe specific back practices. There are the Bhakti Sutras is what... Yes, the Nanda Bhakti Sutra is sort of preliminary compared to this. The Vaishnavas have very specialized practices for you know in, for invoking a gopi bhava upon yourself. Yeah. So Nanda Bhakti Sutra is something that we can all benefit from it straight away. But these practices are esoteric. These would be require yeah. you to have progressed in a Vaishnava path to a certain level before you can safely use those practices. Yeah, so these are the bhavas. And it's strongly recommended that we cultivate some bhava towards the divine. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. So, so from here, this is interesting because I, I would like to take it this way, um, and then we can move back in a second. Um, we we were talking about God, but this is a very charged word. When we talk about it. When we <laughs> we bring it to the Western context, right? Like you had a conversation with with Sam Harris, or you talked to Bernardo Castro, or you talked to David Charles. We don't use the word God there. We use consciousness. Consciousness. Now, how? How do you see that? Is God, is consciousness and consciousness alone, or is God something more than consciousness? Or yeah. it, it, this is, I, I think, where where sometimes I, I think for me, I think when we engage with a lot of the people in the West, we, we want to break it down to the easiest way for them to understand. And the way we do that is say God is consciousness, right? And then Advaitic tradition, uh, Satya Gara Mananta Brahma would be understood, but as God being pure awareness, pure consciousness, pure uh, being. Yes. Um, now, and my follow-up question to that will be like, do you, within the Ramakrishna tradition, does is God just bare being consciousness and uh, reality, or does he possess these as qualities too, right? Like Swarupa Jnana, Dharma Bhuta Jnana kind of thing. Let me start with that. The, in the Ramakrishna order, well, our, yeah. understanding, our understanding, we are primarily Advaitic, but it's heavily inflected through the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, and this tradition, the particular tradition, and very um, liberal about it. It's not Advaita versus Vishishta Advaita, Advaita, and so on. Now, um, so in the Ramakrishna tradition, the concept of God is what one might call maximal. What you just said, pure being, a bare being, and bare consciousness. No, not that. Uh, it's maximal. It includes that, but everything else also. And you could have all of these aspects, God as the absolute, which is just pure being, mm -hmm. uh, which is pure awareness. And by the way, there I'll, I'll get into that, but their awareness or consciousness is actually technically different from what people would sort of straight away understand as consciousness when you speak to them, even to for professionals in philosophy or neuroscience, it's different. Yes. Um, so that is included. That is what we mean by God, but also that same being uh, who is the creator, preserver, destroyer of the of the world? The same being is um, the Shiva of the Shaivites. Uh, we worship, we do Shivaratri for full all night long in in uh, the Ramakrishna order. In many of our ashrams, uh, it is the 
uh, Kali of the, of the Shaktas. Um, it is Vishnu, Narayana of the Vaishnavas, the creator, preserver, destroyer of the world. And this is where it connects to other religions also. So when I say God, I am not, um, I'm actually talking about what they are talking about. Mm -hmm. Notice, uh, I mean, I've been told what word God does not mean what we mean by Brahman. I think too much is me being made of that because yeah. what do you mean by Brahman and what does the Christian theologian mean by God? You will see the primary definition of God is the creator of this universe. Right. And that's not ours. Which of the omni qualities, omnip yeah. omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. What do you mean by Brahman? You mean exactly the same thing. Um, that Asya, that Janmadhyasya Yataha, the second uh, sutra in the Brahma Sutras. What is Brahman? Uh, Asya Jagata Janma Stiti Bhanga Yasma Tad Brahma. This entire universe is projected. Comes from, yeah. Rishti, stiti exists there and dissolves back into it. That is Brahman. It's literally the creator God of um, the Abrahamic religions. There. Does it have these omni qualities? Certainly. Ananta Kalyana Gunagana. Yeah. Uh, Ramanuja yeah. says. The limitless yeah. auspicious qualities. What about Advaita Vedanta? Advaita, in Advaita Vedanta, these are very precisely defined. The ultimate reality is not God as you would know it. Brahman, Nirguna Brahman is not God, not Jiva, not the Jagat as we would talk about it. It is existence, consciousness, bliss, Sat, Chit, Ananda. That's the closest you can get. Or even you can say Neti, Neti, Atma. It's, yeah. it's not, not that. But the, it's the same Sat, Chit, Ananda, which is also Saguna Brahman. This is what people miss out. Mm. This existence, consciousness, bliss, Sat, Chit, Ananda, with the power of Maya, which is called Saguna Brahman in Advaita Vedanta, which is uh, the Ishwara, Bhagavan in the other uh, dualistic traditions, and broadly speaking, God in the Abrahamic traditions. So it is not such a big stretch to use the word God there. Mm -hmm. There are, of course, very, not, not just differences of nuance, there are huge ontological differences when you come to Advaita Vedanta uh, regarding God. So when I say consciousness to Sam Harris, to David Chalmers, I mean two things there. I mean, first of all, what they mean by consciousness. What, say, for example, David Chalmers means by consciousness. Just this conscious experience, what anybody means by consciousness. Anybody who's trained in philosophy of mind, in neuroscience, this consciousness which we have, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, this is called Vritti Jnana in Advaita Vedanta. But this consciousness is not different from the underlying, um, what we call pure consciousness or Swarupa Jnana, uh, consciousness itself. Yeah. Which is a new concept, which is not yet a clearly understood concept in Western neuroscience, um, Western philosophy of mind, and certainly not in neuroscience. Again, Sam Harris understands this because yeah. he has studied Advaita to some extent, and he studied Tibetan Dzogchen Buddhism uh, to a great extent and practiced it himself. He is quite uh, aware of the, you know, awareness. Let's say yeah. he says he is entirely dismissive of all kinds of religion. And also all the, the theological aspects of Buddhism and, and Advaita also. However, he says in these two systems of India, Advaita Vedanta and the what is now the Dzogchen Buddhism in Tibet, in those, these two systems, he says there's a core of truth which even the hardest of skeptics and you know the atheists cannot deny. I mean, if you reason, you cannot deny that such a thing is there once you begin to understand what they're talking about. So at that level, I can relate to people who are not at all interested in religion. If I go and ta start talking about Krishna to David Chalmers, uh, he would lose interest. He would be polite about it. But he... yeah. <laughs> Wait, are, are you telling me he's not interested in me? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> no, so, but, he, but this is an interesting point, uh, Swamiji, because oh, yeah. it's like when when we talk about consciousness, they're, we mean consciousness, but they mean mind. Because ah. they're very concerned, because yeah. our structure within, if you think about Samkhya and the Vedanta, the mind, buddhi, mahat, intellect, all these things fall under prakriti. They're all nature, different from consciousness. Clear. And, the, and then Clear. for them, the mind but, is consciousness. This right? is one these, of the things which I'm arguing that Indian philosophy can bring to the modern debate yeah. about consciousness studies. That's right. This is not clearly distinguished. And I uh, did this um, course, which helped me a lot at the philosophy department at the Harvard Divinity School mm -hmm. uh, on philosophy of mind. Just an introduction to the literature and philosophy right. of mind today. And I saw actual philosophical problems which have become sort of knots, which they can't untie, which have, the, Easily. the distinction between consciousness and mind would have right. uh, clarified it. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know if it will solve neuroscience problems, but it, it no. can solve some problems in philosophy of mind. If you take this seriously and try to understand this. 
and it doesn't require Advaita. Sankhya holds that to be true. Yoga holds Buddhist theories, Nyaya, every school of Indian philosophy that I know about understands the distinction between mind and consciousness. Yes. And it is something not at all clear in the modern yeah. mind in the West. Because it, it stems from, you know, Descartes, Jajanka, Jaswi, right? So it, it's just, I, I think, therefore I am. And Indian thought is... Oh, I, I've never heard the French version earlier. Yeah, so that's... It, it, it's it's yeah, always so, it's in French. He rewrote it in Latin later. But um, in 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 uh in art system, it's uh, Shankara himself says basically, I know, therefore I exist. Yes, it's it's, it's very different than I think. Right, it's, a thought is a chitta, chitti vritti, right? It's a movement. Right, and this pure consciousness. There are so many words for it in Indian philosophy. Pragna, yeah, so, yeah, so on. Yeah, Chit, Pragna, yeah, yeah chitti, so Pragna. Uh, bodha, yeah. Chaitanya, uh, the Atman. So Atman. all all of these uh, were the different words which um, express different ways of expressing that idea of consciousness by itself. And there's a very great, excellent and very elegant experiential way of seeing it for ourselves just now. Advaita Vedanta, uh, he says, uh, Padma Pada Acharya, Anidam Chaitanyam. How do you understand consciousness by itself? Understand it yeah. at least. Whatever can be designated as idam in our own this. experience, this, Labor. Yeah, yeah, this. it's an object. Mm -hmm. it's an object. This is Drigdisha Viveka, right? Yeah, exactly. Drigdisha Viveka builds upon it. So now, right yeah. now, this um, table, this computer, this, so mm -hmm. it's not consciousness, it's an object. Mm -hmm. But then I come to this shirt. Yes, this, if you said this, it's an object. If I come to this body, and you say, aha, see, you can la label the body as this. Clearly you can. Even your own mm -hmm. body, you can label it as this body. In that case, it's not you. It's not consciousness. Um, then this sensation, and I breathe in and breathe out, the sensation of warmth or cold, this, so it's not consciousness. These, this distinction, is, we are entering a realm which is now foggy in the modern philosophy of uh, mm -hmm. mind. Uh, because they would say, yeah, but it's conscious experience, isn't it? Here, there are two sides of it. Conscious experience is always consciousness plus object. Object. Yes. Is equal to experience. What And the object is that which you can designate as this. In your own experience, whatever you can label yeah. as this is yeah. an object. It's not consciousness. And you can go all the way back to the subtlest experiences in the mind. You know, the mm. finest aesthetic experiences. The subtlest intellectual um, thoughts and understanding one can have in the mind, in the buddhi. All of it is this. This. Appearing to something which is never an object, ever the subject, and that is pure consciousness. Mm. Uh, but that's always you'll notice immediately it has to be you. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. It has to be you. Yeah, yeah but, but the lot, con yeah. consciousness also has a self-reflective nature, where it can perceive itself, which yes, is that is I have to be careful there. Uh -huh. I remember. A scornful look from Professor Parimal Patil at Harvard University. Self-reflecting. What, what do you think? This is magic? <laughs> <laughs> Philosophically, technically speaking, it they can't be self-reflective. The self-reflectivity, because grammatically, thing cannot act on itself. Uh, uh, thing cannot illumine itself. But so I mean, but but that's the thing yeah, within. You're right. What you mean is correct. Uh, the correct term in Advaita would be swaprakasha. Yeah, self swaprakasha. Yeah. Self-luminous. It it reveals itself and reveals everything else. Right. Um, so Swaprakasha consciousness is Swaprakasha in fact it's the only thing that is Swaprakasha right. everything else is revealed to consciousness you know um, so the world is revealed to you the conscious being your own body is revealed to you the conscious being your thoughts are revealed to you the conscious being consciousness right. is this is the whole whole issue which we get into a very big issue of uh, philosophy here I mean it's not a time to resolve it but the issue is this <laughs> consciousness is epistemologically prior right is it ontologically prior according to advaita vedanta consciousness is both epistemologically and ontologically prior in the sense that it exists first then everything else comes after it modern science would not dispute that consciousness is necessary for epistemology to know things at least mm -hmm. human beings need consciousness uh, so yeah it depends on consciousness but your consciousness is a very johnny come lately you know the Big Bang and the matter and then planets and stars and planets and evolution of life and then sophisticated nervous systems and brains and then what we call consciousness. Right. 
Uh, this all assumes a materialist reductionist paradigm. Yeah. This is a hard problem, right? That's why they add the this hard, is the hard problem. problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is the hard problem. Yeah. This, uh, hard problem. this is beautiful, Swamiji. Before, I mean, please finish uh, on, on your train of thought, but I wanted to ask you about Sakshi Bhava later. I know we talked about, you know, the Vatsalaya Bhava and, you know, the, all the different types of relationship to God, but this is a slightly different question. And what does that mean to cultivate the Sakshi Bhava? I think it has to do with like the Manduka Upanishad, the two birds on the tree. Uh, Mundaka. Were... Mundaka has the two Mundaka, birds. Sorry, sorry, Mundaka. Sorry, thank you. Yes. So the what you're referring to is the Dwa Suparna Sayuja Sakhaya. That means two birds of golden plumage. Uh, uh -huh. They were sitting on this tree. One uh -huh. was hopping around and eating fruits, <laughs> sweet and bitter. And the other uh -huh. one on top of the tree just looking on. Abhijakashiti. Uh, anashna nanyo abhijakashiti without eating without consuming anything it just sits there looks huh. and then the lower bird looks up and says oh that bird is so happy and peaceful that's <laughs> nice it eats a particularly bitter fruit and gets a shock and says I want to be like that I don't want this anymore this is awful and it hops up towards the higher bird but in between gets attracted by a very nice looking luscious fruit and goes and maybe just this once more and then gets caught again more fruit pecking, picking and uh, eating until it gets another shock and remembers the higher bird, which is still there. And so on. So, so goes the spiritual journey until finally the lower bird approaches the higher bird and suddenly sees that transfigured into I am that higher bird. There was never any lower bird. And that's the end of the story. So that higher bird is the Sakshi, the witness. Witness in the sense of um, illumination. That which is that which shines and illumines everything. The Upanishad comes says this again and again. Uh, that shining, everything else shines by its light. It's... Everything here is lit up. Tameva bhanta manubhati sarvam tasya bhasa sarvam idam vibhati. You shining, everything else shines by your light. Everything here is lit up. Everything means you shining. The mind is lit up by that, and then the mind shining, the senses are lit up by that. The senses shining, the world is revealed. Up, yeah. Um. So. This shining light, mm. which is pure consciousness, this is called a Sakshi. Sakshi in the mm. sense of luminosity, of illumining everything. It is there right now. It is mm. not a Bhava. It is not, not a Bhava. Yeah, but it's not a Bhava. You can no. cultivate it. But the cultivated Sakshi Bhava is an activity of the mind. Mm. So I don't do anything and sit quietly and serenely watch. So, like mindfulness meditation, for example. So, instead of plunging in and engaging, I watch the breath, the in, in breath and the out breath. I watch the sensations in the body, pleasant and unpleasant. I watch the emotions. I watch the th thoughts arising, memories arising and disappearing in the mind. The presence of those memories, the absence of those memories. This is an activity of the mind. Now, uh, this is not what Advaita Vedanta means. It's a very helpful activity of the mind. Mm -hmm. it's a thing mm -hmm. to cultivate. It's a great meditative practice. But Advaita Vedanta, this is precisely where the uh, Advaita's point is. Mm. Real Sakshi is pure consciousness. Yes. Mm. Which you are right now. Whether you know it or you do not know it, you are the Sakshi. Whether you practice something or you do not practice anything, you are the Sakshi. Whether you are waking, dreaming, sleeping, you are the Sakshi. Okay. Whether you are a holy person, a monk sitting in the Himalayas, or you are uh, um, fighting the a dog here. <laughs> the dog there? Yeah. yeah. I, I have a dog here too. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, okay. Both of them are huskies. I know. This one's a pit, pit bull collie. Oh, pit bull collie. Yeah, that's why. Oh, I, I can see. Yes, yes. Now I can make out it. The difference. And uh, the your dog is a husky? Yeah, I have two dogs. This one is this one is Roma Harshana. The other one is Vajrasena. Vajrasena. They're both Roma huskies. Harshana. Yeah. Roma Harshana. <laughs> so, uh, they, they're huskies? Yeah. They're huskies, yeah. Do you um, have a dog, Swami? Do you have a dog? No, but I love dogs. Somebody, when I came to the United States, a Swami asked me, an American Swami in India, yeah. me, so you're going to the United States. Do you like dogs? I said, yeah, I like, I love dogs because many Swamis don't. So uh -huh. I like dogs. He says, good, then you will succeed in the United States <laughs> <laughs> because everybody loves dogs here, and especially yeah. here in New York. People just love dogs, and I love dogs too. But I'll just—it's also funny because, like, as much as pe people say in India they don't like dogs. The motifs throughout the entire uh, uh, literature is dogs are always with Shiva has dogs. The uh, you know like uh, Datatreya has dogs. Dog, no, yeah. Dogs are always uh, uh, Indra's dog Sarama. It's just yeah. 
Yes, Swami Vivekananda had a dog in in the main <laughs> monastery. <laughs> what kind of dog was it? What kind? I don't know. I'm not very sure. Nobody. No mentioned. problem. I will do research. Yeah. <laughs> I'll ask Medananda. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So coming back to this point, the Sakshi. Um, the Sakshi. Yeah. 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 Sakshi. So, so I'll just conclude with this funny story. I mean, it's very instructive. One monk is teaching about the Sakshi, an Advaitic teacher, yeah, and Hindi, and then he says to those assembled monks. So after all this listening to this, you feel that you are the witness uh, and they must have said, yes, I, I just read this actually. And then the monk, the teacher said, You're going to fall into a very big pit because the Sakshi which you feel right now is basically a calm, observant state of the mind. It's right. a state. state. It will come and go. The Atman, pure consciousness is not a state. Oh. It's constantly present effortlessly so it has to be recognized yeah. so on this point you know i want to bring up something else i think is very interesting so we're talking about the nature of consciousness the mind do you within your uh, actually your your personal position do you believe in free will because i'm i'm, I'm <laughs> very anti-free will i don't i i think this this structure of consciousness as separate insofar as it's not a product of physical processes and doesn't involve itself in the physical processes is observing the processes as Correct. they occur. Yeah. So the Raga Dveshas, the Vasanas, the pulls Correct. that's already happening. And the, and the, we assume because the merger between the consciousness pervading the body and pervading the mind and everything, we, we think that we are this thing when in fact, Atma is having the experience of being Mukunda, the robot that acts in this world as a feedback loop, but thinks itself to be that being. You have a lot of support coming your way right now. Uh, uh, I think it was Robert Sapolsky. Robert Sapolsky, he studied the uh, the, the ba bamboo, uh, the, the monkeys, right? For 18 years. Yeah, Africa. right, right. And yeah, yeah, I'm very familiar with his work. Yeah, he's great. <laughs> he's, I, I didn't know about him. I didn't know about him, our uh, Swami Medhananda. Uh, told me about him the latest book determined a life ah, the science yeah, of life yeah. without free will you should look it up it's i just bought the book oh, yeah yeah he, he's a he's a lovely gentleman he has a beard he speaks very nicely he's yeah. lovely because because he has a beard yeah <laughs> yeah swamiji have you ever had a beard before by the way no i have except one time in the himalayas i grew a little bit of a beard but otherwise i i've never uh, had a beard in our order we are always clean shaven yeah, uh, yeah. So, somebody reviewed his book uh, determined yeah. Uh, and uh, I think Oliver Berkman in The Guardian, uh, he said, uh, Sapolsky writes like a vastly erudite, uh, but stoned West Coast slacker. <laughs> 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 so, yes. But what you're saying, but the amazing thing is, you know this. You have studied the Gita so well. You know this, that Krishna says exactly this. What yeah, Ishwar Buddha. He says, Ahamkara. Yeah. He says, you're deluded <laughs> by thinking that you're the doer, right? Correct. You're the doer. You're not the doer. God is the doer. doer. You're not the doer. Naham um, karta, hari karta, they say, right? Right. So in a devotional sense, you might put it as God is the doer. Sri Ramakrishna <laughs> would often say that. That um, everything is the will of God. Uh, and man is deluded into thinking that he is the doer. Or you may not use God language. Yeah. The Gita, for example, says the same thing with God language and without God language. Prakriti va karmani kriyamanani sarvasha yapashyati tathatmana makattaram sapashyati Prakriti, uh -huh. alone, nature alone does everything that is being done here. And the Asmik one who recognizes this, recognizes that I am not the agent of actions. I am the Atman, the witness of all, all things. This is literally the essence of what um, Sapolsky is trying to say. Uh, I don't know if he knows this. He, he probably doesn't, that it's in the yeah. Gita. Of course, he's bringing to bear enormous amounts of cognitive science and neuroscience upon this. But the movement is there. Vivekananda said, Free will is a contradiction in terms. Yeah. Uh, huh. Huh. So what does Advaita Vedanta say? And in fact, other philosophies also. Um, there is freedom. But the will is not free. That's right. Yeah. It generates an illusion of, of freedom. Now, there's a beautiful resolution to this. So what do you do with all this? Uh, there's a beautiful resolution to this. Arindam Chakravarti has written an article, an essay. Why pray to a God who can hear the anklets on an ant's feet? That's right. Yeah, uh, this, yeah. uh, this is a statement uh, from Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna would say that God hears everything. He hears the sound of the anklets 
on the uh, the feet of an the ant has such tiny feet and imagine little <laughs> anklets put there and the tiny sound God hears that also. But if God knows all this, then why pray to such a God? God knows everything. And so there he goes, launches into a 20-page discussion, a beautiful survey, Arindam Chakravarti, a beautiful survey of various theories of uh, determinism, various theories of libertarianism, that there is free will, various compatibilist theories, and then comes to the conclusion that three levels. One is, at our level, we feel that we have free will. We assume we, that we have free will. Yeah. And we better, because our whole society is predicated on that. Yes. Economics, your free choice uh, in the supermarket, your uh, choice in uh, voting for uh, Trump or Biden, your uh, choice uh, uh, in uh, uh, doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. So politics, economics, law, all of these totally assumes free will. You can't punish somebody if you prove, prove for example, reduced capacity. Reduced capacity for yeah. what? Free will. Intent, is. intent, intent. Yeah, uh, yeah. Intent. So intent assumes free will entirely. Um, so all of that uh, is, you better, this is level one. We feel we have free will. It's not just a question of a little bit of a illusion, illusion within our brains. Our whole society yeah. is perverted by this concept. It's a, it's a legal fiction that we, we all it engage is, in. It Absolutely. is a legal fiction. And all of religion, all these teachings, moral teachings, spiritual teachings, yogic teachings, none of them would make any sense unless you had some freedom yes. to do something about it. Except, however, Advaitic teachings, which is just knowledge. You are informed of something. Uh, now, all of this is at level one. Then Arindam Chakravarti goes on to level two, where through investigation in philosophy of mind, in neuroscience, and religion and spirituality, all of them seem to be coming together to say, or just the science itself, philosophy of science, everything must be determined. There is a causal change from the beginning of the Big Bang till today. Yeah. Something like free will is radical. How is it possible? You uh, may do something. magic. Quantum, More magic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like magic. You may try to <laughs> smuggle it in through, I don't know, quantum mechanics or prob probability. But still, it's not, it's not logical. There is a causal uh, chain. So it seems that though we assume free will in everything, there cannot be in reality free will. And then finally comes to his own co contribution at the very end, which is, I think, very beautiful for spiritual seekers. Mm -hmm. He says, what do you do with this then? You take your undeniable sense of free will and recognize that it's not your will. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Use that to recognize that it's not your will. No. And it translates into a continuous sense of surrender to the divine. But but this okay, is the so beauty of this, right? So, oh, uh, 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 yeah, so Swamiji, beautiful. this is the beauty part. Well, we talked earlier about you know uh, 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 Saint Maria and and Hitler, right? Or, or, or Mother Teresa and Hitler. When you think about it from the perspective of this, then you recognize you can't but feel sorry for all beings, even the person that Hitler is and what he's doing, the terrible things. The Atma is experiencing this 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 body doing this thing, right? And then, like in our world, it's terrible, it's horrible. The impact is disastrous. But body then there's and and yeah, it's true. The persons can be really bad persons and really yeah. good persons, but still yeah, not but, the Atma. Yeah. yeah, exactly, right? So the so the Atman's experiencing this this bad person, this bad person, but there's suffering going on there too, right? So like you can't but feel compassion this is why i think like you know krishna says vidya vinaya sampanne brahmane kavi hastini kavi hastini yes yeah sumi ji sofa pandita samadash you have to see like vasudeva sarvabahu nam jamanante right this concept that if you don't if you recognize that all this is being done not by you but by nature ishwara whatever how do you have anger how do you have frustration how do you have like a, you know feel the need for revenge these things fall away because Gone. it's not. It's, not, it's, a, it's yeah. all all praise, all praise and blame go away. Even when you you can't feel any pride after that because you know you didn't do it, and you can't blame the other because you know they're just acting out their karma. But the, so, but the flip side is society can't run that way. Society doesn't run that way. Yeah, no. yeah. you, you way, can't. You can't have it run that way, right? As long as you'd be, you'd be interested in Northern Mukunda I used to be a district attorney in New York City. And I used to be a public defender in San Francisco. Wow. So we're both, we both went to law school. And so that's why when you learn about these concepts in Vedanta, our system does not acknowledge any of this. It, it blames everyone as the doer and they go to intent, but then you can always keep going back. It's, I don't know what to make of this. No, I think it's all right. Um, 
you it is compatible so for example uh, just look at the law of karma mm -hmm. cause and effect simple an, yeah what would what what would an advaitin say to the law of karma after enlightenment advaitin would say that the, the law of karma keeps on working as, exactly as it works now yeah keeps going yeah yep. and so who gets the results of karma you the body gets it the personality gets it uh, but you as atman what what value enlightenment has is that uh, you as atman you realize you are beyond it all mm -hmm. vivekananda put it this way good good bad bad and none escape the law however mm -hmm. then he says whoever wears a form wears the chain too but far beyond name and form is atman ever free no thou art that sanyasi bold say om tat sat om <laughs> <laughs> He notice he doesn't bring in Jagat Mithyatva here. Yeah, 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 yeah. The law of karma is false. It's all a dream. Anyway, you can forget it. You are, you're all right. He doesn't go that far. He says you take it as real, as real as anybody takes it. But I'm pointing out a deeper reality to you. So uh -huh. The deeper reality is the Atman, which you are. I so, heard the more, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 no. You go ahead. I'm gonna change. I'm gonna add just, to this. Gonna, just a Chuma joke. You know, the, I heard the deepest song is row, row, row your boat gently down a stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. <laughs> Go ahead, Mukana. There is a corresponding uh, Kali Kirtan. Oh, um, tell me. It, it goes like this, a Bengali song, which is very, a, a pop, very popular among the monks, a song to the Divine Mother. Um, Shankari Charone Mon Magno Hoi Raure. Um, oh, my mind, remain immersed at the feet of uh, of Shankari. That means uh, Gauri, Parvati, uh, Devi. Very, uh, then, uh, e tin shangshar miche, miche bhrumiye badaure. These three worlds, you call it heaven, earth, hell, whatever you call it, waking, dreaming, deep sleep, the causal, the subtle, and the physical universe. These are all appearances. Mm -hmm. These are uh, miche, that means mithya. They are all mithya. appearances. Uh, miche bhrumiye badaure. In vain do you roam around these three worlds. You remain immersed at the feet of the, uh, at the divine feet of 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 the mother. Uh -huh. And then it says, "Bhavir um, nodi." Um, it says, "Is a shukher nodi nirabadi." This is a river of bliss flowing ceaselessly. Dhire dhire bawaure. Row gently through it. Dhire dhire. Lovely. Like, lovely. Dhire dhire. Yeah, row gently through Gently row through it. You're awesome. reminded of the little boats plying on the uh, yeah. river Ganga, you know, and they row. Yeah. Um, in the evenings, they light a little lamp in them. And so we are like the sentient beings on the river of life. We are like that. Gently row down this. It's a river. It's a river of bliss. Once you realize what it is, it's a river of bliss. Gently row down to it. Keep centered on the on the mother and keep your mind centered at the feet of the mother. This river itself will take you to this is in Bengali, uh, Brahmananda uh, uh, Ramakrishna Puta Ganga, Brahmananda Shagore Dhai. The, the pure Ganga of Ramakrishna is ever racing to the ocean of Brahmananda, the bliss of Brahman. You float down, you will reach it. That's you fantastic. It's just beautiful. Can you tell the name of the song again, Swamiji? Yes, I can. If you, I'll send me an, an uh, email. Email. Like it's sure. available on online also. So sung by the monks. It is beautiful. Called... And you know, even in Buddhism, Buddha discusses a raft as well, right? He talks yeah. about the, the raft analogy. Always this raft, Bhava Sagara. You know, crossing Bhava the ocean. ocean of life. Setu Ram, Bridge Ram, right? Crossing the well, ocean. Well, in the Gospel of the Gita, Nasti Buddha Yuktasya Najabhav. Yes. Shanti, right? The, the the boat that's floating in the water, pulled yeah. by its senses everywhere. You yes. know, <laughs> away by the wind of the desire. Yeah. Um, so the name of the song is uh, Shankari Charone Mon Magno Hoi Raure. Uh, Shankari Charone. Shankari Charone. Bengali. Beautiful. Bengali. Yeah. And by the way, and Swami Medananda, whenever he gives any lecture, he always says, you guys need to learn Bengali because you're not reading <laughs> the original Sri Sri Ramakrataka. He, he need, but Nikananda didn't translate it correctly. He always says this in every lecture. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it was Indriyanam hi charatam. That was the line. Indriyanam uh, charatam. Yeah. No I, I remember this monk uh, teaching in Hindi <laughs> and about translation. And somebody asked him um, that, uh, so now we have so many good translations into Hindi and Indian languages. Uh, so, what do we really need to learn Sanskrit? And this mm. monk, um, uh, he he was one of the great translators of the 20th century. He said, listen, 
I have translated the Upanishads with the commentaries of, San of Shankara into Hindi. Huh. I have translated the Ramayana into Hindi. I have translated the Bhagavata Purana into Hindi. I have translated uh, like numerous Bhagavad Gita uh, mm. into, into Hindi, um, numerous Puranas into Hindi. And, and all of those books are the books that uh, Hindi speaking people in India are reading today. He was the translator for the Gita Press, mm. Swami. And he says, after doing all of that, I tell you, you need to learn Sanskrit. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think that's totally interesting and fair. I, I, I want to follow up because I know our time is coming up, but I want to follow hey, up. No, wait, 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 one quick question before you move on. Do you, yeah. Is that also true? Do you need to learn Bengali if you really need to understand the Sri Sri Ram? If, if you want to, but I have, I have known many spiritual seekers, devotees of Sri Ramakrishna who don't know a word of Bengali and very devoutly oh. study the English trans, English translation of okay. the gospel and, and do very well indeed. So. Okay, thank you. That gives me some hope. I thought I had to learn Bengali also. <laughs> No, it's, it's not compulsory. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Samaji. Give me some hope. So this is where I, I find interesting on a, a top, uh, touching on the topic from before about consciousness and uh, the difference between the Eastern and Western concepts of the mind being part of Prakriti. So there's a lot of fear, especially with this new, all this AI coming out, right? That, you know, suddenly machines are going to be conscious because the equivoc equivocation with intellect and mind with consciousness I wonder how different yeah. that would appear once you start thinking about how do we determine something is conscious or not conscious? I think that's another question to, to try to understand because intelligence and awareness and mind are not indication of consciousness. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. You, have put, yeah. you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. For, uh, and I, for Swamiji, you, I think you, you, already, you, you and Bernardo Castro have already discussed this. And that big fallacy of just because something is intelligent or functional, it doesn't mean it has an inner life. Yeah. And, and, and what, the one thing Bernardo Castro says is he, he, he comes up with this analogy of imagine we come up with a, a water pipes and, and, and um, to create like a, uh, like a basically a circuit. Would that ever become alive? Because that's basically what a microchip does. We would never imagine that mechanical levers and, and pipes would ever become and have an inner life. Yeah. Right. right. Go ahead, Swamiji. Yeah, close it out. You're right. That's the that's the crux of the whole whole thing. I mean, how how would you know that these systems are conscious? I mean, you could ask. I asked Chat GPT, and it said that no, I'm not conscious. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, I use this argument. So this is a new argument for the hard problem of consciousness. It's yeah. this: um, these machines now, computers and the machines enabled by these computers. Um, are able to do a lot of things which we thought were the province of only minds, of human minds earlier. So not only do they have memory, calculators have had prodigious memory for a long time now, but uh, they have they can use senses. I mean, I always say when you go into a enter a, um, uh, an airport, the door opens for you. That's a tiny mm -hmm. sensor they're right there. Yeah. Um, so uh, they have senses, they have memory. They take. They have decision making capacity. The Google self driving car takes lots of decisions, just like any human driver probably does a better jo job of it. Also, they are intelligent in many ways. Now, things which were uh, regarded as part of the human provenance earlier, uh, creativity, for example, mm -hmm. um, Chat GPT's text text based um, artificial intelligences are doing a great job. They're writing poetry, maybe not poet laureate material, but not bad either. It's not schoolboy material either. And and they have they can do one thing which no poet in the world can ever do, is I asked Chat GPT to write a poem on Vivekananda and did a pretty good job, but then the unique thing about these machines I asked it to write another poem and yet another poem and yet another poem each time it wrote another poem within seconds and each different and each not bad at all no human poet can ever do that, um, so <laughs> all of this it does intelligence creativity memory a, a reasonable. Uh, you know, facsimile of emotions, uh, then um, uh, uh, activities in the world like driving and things like that, and writing short stories, painting pictures and things like that, uh, composing music, except one thing. This is my argument. Except one thing. They are not conscious. Hmm. And if no inner life. Oh, no yeah. inner life. 
yeah ask any of the people in silicon valley um, in the in the bay area all the computer people uh, are your machines conscious they'll laugh they'll say we don't even know where to begin they are not conscious at least we never programmed them to be conscious we have programmed them to be everything else it, it takes a lot of hard work to right. make these things work um so therefore my question here is this consciousness is one aspect of our inner experience um, that forget all philosophy everybody is aware that they are aware there's something called yeah. aware an inner first person experience the qualia and so on that everybody's everybody we all have all animals have it also it should be pretty simple consciousness does just one thing it gives you first person experience that's yeah. all that consciousness does inner life inner life, inner life. that's your lived experience that's pretty simple in fact creativity is complex intelligence is complex they're difficult things ai can do all of that except be conscious hmm. which leads to the conclusion then in that case consciousness is not of the same category of things as uh, memory and right. uh, intelligence and creativity the it's meta level one yeah. it's on a different level it's it's not just one more feature of our minds it's a different thing altogether right it, it, hollywood doesn't help there was a movie called ex machina that came out and it, it makes for fantastic science fiction thrillers when robots become alive and become evil right i mean that's what i think this has happened in our popular, popular imagination <laughs> no but but even even if that does happen again the question is our body still functions it goes forth like the atma is there to experience what the body does and feels and 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 uh has the mental states this is a machine one, this, this, yeah yeah absolutely one one minute yeah. let me just pause real quick <laughs> okay uh Swamiji. excellent yeah we we're, we're just talking about the the, the the ai and consciousness and um yeah I, I, you know I was, the point i was trying to drive was even our bodies are really robotic in that nature in the same way and interesting enough like our neural networks have originally were built around trying to do the things our brain does the way our brain does it and now right. it's a little different but still it's, it seems to me that what we're trying to do again is to replicate the human body there's no way to replicate human consciousness and there's no metabolism that's something that bernardo castro talks about is yeah. he he concedes if we can somehow create something that metabolizes then maybe we have no but metabolism is, a, is an aspect of the body too anyway i think yeah true, 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 true. yeah so there is a, this uh, argument against the hard problem of consciousness uh, i heard it from uh, massimo who is a philosopher yeah, yeah. Uh, he's philosophy. awesome yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah he's awesome. stoic philosophy a uh, uh, biologist Great. here at, at uh, cuny so he we i used to attend some of his philosophy discussion groups here when they were held in person so once uh, we were having this discussion on consciousness and uh, he said to me that look whatever it is i'm convinced that consciousness is only possible in living brains um then he said that see life itself was regarded as a mystery which science could not solve and yet within 100 years now uh, now at this juncture we have understood life down to the its its molecular components so give us some more time and we will understand consciousness in terms of brain activity and living about what is going on in the living brain i gave the advaitic um the counter argument i don't know if it made any sense to him but the argument is fairly simple that you are making a category mistake so an explanation is taking a com complex phenomenon and explaining it in terms of more fundamental phenomena that's an explanation basically so yes when you say i have explained life which is an object phenom objective phenomena in terms of more fundamental objective phenomena molecules uh, the activities of molecules and i consider this to be an explanation of life uh, good enough uh, that's possible technically in principle that's fine mm -hmm. but when you say i am going to explain consciousness in terms of objective phenomena going on in the brain you are making a category mistake sure yeah. you're jumping from the subject to the object yeah. to very different things it, you're saying i'm going to reduce the subject into objective phenomena no uh, they, they, you're making a, a fundamental mistake you're going to trying to explain pure consciousness in terms of the this uh, so right, right. that won't work but uh, i don't know if you saw the point in that argument yeah i i i think uh, a lot of the the material reductionists have issues around it right because there's it, it's they can't conceive of something that's outside of the system and and that's what consciousness is 
It's like, outside of the system. Yeah, like, but they think it's a, they think it's an epiphenomenon. Yeah, that's right. The, that's what the misunderstanding but is. It can't be outside the system. That's yeah. magic thinking. So it is within the system, and therefore it's an epiphany, some kind of product of the brain. So exactly. I, I always say that my takeaway from my impression of the philosophy of mind um, was in the it's a sub, it's a subject that has stalled. The last yeah. person who said something interesting was Descartes, three hundred more than three hundred years ago, the Cogitor Gusum. And in the last hundred years, if you see the papers, the literature on this, especially on mind and consciousness, yeah, there are two kinds of papers. There is these kinds of papers, uh, works, books or papers, which try to reduce mind and consciousness because they regard it as indistinguishable. Yeah. Mind and consciousness into brain activity, mostly. Or sometimes when the common language philosophy was popular at Oxford, into uh, a linguistic confusion, right. uh, into behavior. So these are the various ways, reductions. And the second kind of paper is by people who say, famously like Thomas Nagel and others, a number of papers. Uh, which say that, uh, sorry, guys, it doesn't work. For these reasons, the reduction is, is not working. And that's where we are. Yeah. No further progress. Right. Yeah. But but here's, I think, the interesting part is, and I've, I was talking to someone earlier, uh, a few days ago, Western philosophers and scholars don't do anything about meditation, except for maybe those people like Sam Harris, right? They don't understand the inner life. And that to me is like, you're objectifying this thing that is fundamentally non-objectifiable. You have to know the states. It's, I mean, like, it's like asking someone to explain love. Tell me, explain the emotion of love to me. And you can't explain an emotion. It's it's what you feel. And it's, it's, it's what it does to your other states, your, 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 your subsequent states. And, your, and I think this is where the, the failure happens is many of these scholars and philosophers are not people that practice oh. and they don't understand that's because like that would change. It's like if, if suddenly my eyes would have the ability to not just see what I see now in color, but let's say see the color that another animal species could see the oh. world is suddenly different. Oh. Like it, it, the, simply me saying red won't be a red anymore. Maybe it's a different kind oh. of red. It just changes the nature of my experience and the nature of how I understand the world, right? Even the world we understand today is, is really human oriented by mind, visual, mostly visual. Yes. Yes. And we're not taking into account what dogs can experience um, because they have different senses that will focus differently. Like, like this interesting, someone was saying like, we, we, we see someone coming, right? And then we, then we get excited. The dog doesn't see me coming. The wind blows in my, my scent. And then before I even get to the door, the dog's ready. Like, you know, it's, you know it, there's a sense of like, the, our experience of this world are so different. And if we don't have our conscious understanding what those states and our, our uh, data input is, it's very, it, 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 it's limited. That was, that was actually the thrust of that um, classic paper. What is it like to be a bat? Thomas yeah. Nagel. Yeah, that's Th Thomas Nagel, right? That's yeah. the Nagel one. I was just about to say for our listeners, I was going to say there's a paper called What's It Like to Be a yeah, Bat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Swamiji, Swamiji, you have magical powers. You read my mind. This <laughs> <laughs> is talking about the exact same thing. No, but this is, it's fascinating things to me. I, I feel like people lose out when you don't have a, a inner practice in sadhana. You, you do you cannot understand consciousness from out here you, you yeah. have to understand it from in here True. i don't mean in here but like you know <laughs> a scholar practitioner is the best combination i think that's what uh, the pandits and the monks were in the vedantic various vedantic sampradayas right they were all practitioners and they were almost all uh, all of them were scholarly almost beautiful yeah, if you read like people like who write yoga chara, right? You know, like Dignaga, whatever, you know they've practiced. So oh. you 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 get the clear sense of what they're talking about when you've experienced those some of those states about the nature of consciousness being everything is it's it's very, very I think like when we talk about in the Western context, we're just we intellectualize it. We think intellectual level is the highest level of 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 epistemology in some sense. Or I think for us, it's direct perception. In some it's, it's, per, it's personal experience, yeah, yeah. right? Like when they say things like your nature is happiness, your nature is silence. You don't really 
you can read that in a book and it doesn't matter unless you actually experience it, right? Yeah. So somebody put it beautifully. There are two ways of knowing that you're hungry. Um, you know you're hungry. Or I could come as a doctor and take extracts from your uh, gut and uh, look at the fluids there, the acid secretions and the hormones <laughs> secreted, and come to a reasonable conclusion that, you know, with 90% probability, this organism is hungry. Right. That's fair. <laughs> Hey, so, so, how, how are we doing on time? And Swamiji, so, have... so actually, I, I think Swamiji has to go soon. So, um, okay, so yeah, yeah. Can, we ask, can we ask just a couple quick, quick questions? Just sure, really sure. silly that I don't think anyone's ever asked you before, maybe. Sure, sure. Okay, first of all, what was your name before you were Swami? So I can Wikipedia all this, but I just want to hear you can, it. You can look it up, but we generally are not supposed to say the name. Yeah, I mean, they don't say oh. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for, oh, then I won't ask you to say it. Then. Yeah, Never mind. For I'll anybody in the order, I mean, many people know me as Vishwarup Maharaj, which is part of my pre monastic name, but we're generally not supposed to use it. Yeah, they don't do it. It's fine. But, then, but you, you can find it very easily. It's it, <laughs> nowadays. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Is your new name, is it Sarva Priyananda Puri or is it just Sarva yes. Priyananda? Yes. So Sarva Priyananda Puri. So I mean, Sarva ah. Priyananda Puri. That is technically correct because yeah. this lineage comes down through from Vivekananda, goes back to Sri Ramakrishna. Uh, and Sri Ramakrishna's monastic guru was uh, Totapuri, Tota Puri, who oh, belonged yeah. to the Naked Puri Sampradaya. Yeah, of the ten orders of monks established uh, by Adi Shankaracharya. So the Puri. Thank you. And a uh, uh, couple of silly questions. Do you ever wear any other colors besides orange? I do. In fact, just today I was dressed slightly different. <gasps> um, sometimes I go, uh, you know, when I'm in a hurry to get a shave, I go out to the barber shop. And if you wear a dhoti, the hair gets into the... the oh, wrist. yeah, yeah. That's the only time. People ask me, do you wear Western dress? Yes, once in a while, every few months, you'll catch me one day sneaking out in trousers and a shirt. <laughs> to, that's usually the the, uh, the day I get a, a haircut. Okay, Mukunda, do you have any small questions like this or anything else? Just really quick. No, no, no nothing small. No, I do want to appreciate your time. And I, I think, uh, um, if possible, would could you... Uh, it, it, what was the last... Things you want us to tell our audience if we they can, want to. Uh, I was just thinking we can do a, a program focusing entirely on Advaita someday. Oh, I yes, love that. I, I yes, would love to please. do that. Yeah, it's fantastic. So we can, yeah, we can it, schedule it for some time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I wanted to. I wanted to request you maybe say just one shloka for us, or that's that that is meaningful to you right now to to close our conversation maybe too. Would that okay. be a nice way to end it? My favorite, yeah. my favorite Shanti mantra from the Upanishads. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Sri Ramakrishna Thank you, uh, uh, Swamiji. I appreciate your time and um, is, is there any way if people want to reach out to you and find you online, how would they do that? Do you have any uh, social media or anything that they can reach no, out to you? Uh, generally, if people ask questions, they write to ask Swami okay. at uh, ny dot, uh, Vedanta ny dot org. Okay. So there's excellent. a whole session, the whole series of uh, Q&A sessions where the collected questions from the internet, we screen them and take up a few of them in each session and then do a QA. and a that's excellent. So uh, uh, I'll 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 send that information to my uh, subscribers and listeners. Thank you again, Swamiji, for your time and for your consideration. Thanks, Thank Krishna. You. Thank you. Oh, Yamuna tire gayati vanamali gayati vanamali madurum gayati vanamali